Hello. Pretty good. Very nice meeting you again. 아무리綺麗に届いてないというかイヤホンないけど大丈夫。あイヤホンしてないあれ。We are、uh, checking the microphone at the moment. Okay. Now, Ochoa、sure. is、okay. inserting his earphone. Now it is inside. Okay, okay now we can hear you. Okay, I, I hear you perfectly, and I will just wear my earphone on, on one side.、Uh, I think it's clear enough so I can also listen to、uh, this room. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, Ochoa san, for your greeting. So, now we will start the recording. Let's start. So, we'd like to start the program this year. My name is Abe. I will be the moderator of the day. Very nice meeting. Very nice meeting again. Again. <laughs> again I yes. Last year, yeah. Thank you.、Mm -hmm. えー、so, so, it has been a year since we had our last interview. And we originally had、uh, Audrey、uh, an opportunity to、uh, come to Japan, but unfortunately, you couldn't come、um, during the Olympics and Paralympics. Mm -hmm. That's correct.、Uh, I'm even wearing、uh, the team of the,、um, the clothes that was a part of our team, of our Tokyo Olympic、uh, team. So I was supposed to, to wear this to Tokyo,、uh, and I still intend to do so、um, maybe next year. Very nice. Ah, we didn't know you had a uniform. You, you look very nice、mm -hmm. in that. Thank you. <laughs> So, if you were able to come to Japan, we were supposed to have a face to face、um, interview, but、uh, now we are doing it online instead.、Mm. Last time and this time, we have、uh, procured three hours of your very business, busy time. Thank you very much.、Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I don't have anything afterwards, so if it takes four hours, five hours, I'm game, I'm fine. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I think we would like to make five programs out of this interview then. <laughs> so,、um, what was your impression of your last, in,、uh, last uh, discussion, Audrey?、Uh, it, it was really, really、uh, good. I, I learned a lot,、uh, both from the, the work that you do, of course, but also on the response、uh, that people had, both on the initial live streaming and also on the replay around SDGs, where you asked me,、uh, you know, Homo something, and I said Homo sapiens, but with zero and one, right? <laughs> a digital Homo sapiens. So I learned a lot from both the exchange and the interactions afterward. Nice, thank you. So, Ochoa san, it is your second time.、Um, how shall we call each other? I'd like to call you Audrey. Okay. You can call me Yoichi if that's okay with you. Sure, of course. Yoichi it is then. Thank you very much. So, although we have a lot of time,、uh, I think there's a lot to discuss. So, let's start with one question, one answer corner. So, the first few questions we'd like to ask only you, Audrey, and after that, we will like to ask both Yoichi and、uh, Audrey.、Mm -hmm. So, the first question is a very、uh, daily question, so to say.、Mm -hmm. The first question is What was something you ate recently that was very delicious? Not recently,、uh, but it was so delicious that、uh, I still remember it very clearly as if it's recently.、Uh, it's the a m p o g a k i the Fukushima persimmon,、uh, that I、uh, ate when I literally visited Tokyo.、Uh, it was pre COVID,、uh, but、uh, it was so tasty that I posted、uh, on Twitter, Gekiyuma,、uh, saying that it's very tasty. And I still、uh, can kind of summon that memory very easily. <laughs> アンポガキを好きなんですね。ポ、はい、ーーパモンス、ナイス。アンポーパーサモンス、ナイス。アンポーパーサモンス、ナイス。アンポーパーサモンス、ナイス。アンポーパーサモンス、ナイス。アンポーパーサモンス、ナイス。アンポーパーサモンス、ナイス。アンポーパーサモンス、ナイス。アンポーパーサモンス、ナイス。アンポーパーサモンス、ナイス。アンポーパーサモンス、ナイス。ア
When I was eight years old, I programmed on pen and paper and pencil. And after a while,、uh, my parents bought me a personal computer、uh, as a present, and it was the best present that I've ever received because now I don't have to manually calculate the computer's response. You, oh, I didn't know that programming was able to do by hand or manually. Well, so programming is about a procedure, so we could actually write it down. Aha! Interesting. There's so many things that I don't know. Ah,、uh, third question. What is something that you always take with you, or if you have something that you、uh, have been possessing for long for a long time, can you show it to us? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Have you been using that, those pair of glasses for a long time? Yes,、uh, for at least ten years or more,、uh, I've always worn the same style of glass. That is to say, borderless,、uh, free of borders,、uh, eyeglass without borders,、uh, and there's no uh, fixed uh, configuration other than that it's borderless. <laughs> Interesting. Borderless. Do you have any specific meaning that you're giving to this idea of borderless? Yeah, I think、uh, when I focus on something, I want to focus on that thing instead of the intermediary, the eyeglass between me and that thing. So the more invisible the intermediary is, the more authentic the experience. Interesting. Thank you very much. So we also had a lot of questions from our audience as well. So we would like to、uh, proceed to those questions. So what would you do if you can go to outer space?、Um, well, I've been virtually to outer space,、uh, outer space quite a bit, <laughs> right?、Uh, my favorite pastime pastime is to observe the Earth、uh, in front of vantage point of the International Space Station.、Uh, that's indeed my first virtual reality experience. Is on the Star Chart VR,、uh, which is,、uh, I believe, on a、um, Galaxy uh, VR um, device. Uh, it was 2016, and uh, uh, what I do、uh, usually is just to look、uh, at Earth. So no matter、uh, where I position myself in outer space,、uh, as long as Earth is even just dimly visible,、uh, I always anchor myself、uh, to where Earth is, and then I feel safer, and then I'm happy to then explore the rest of the galaxy. So you've already been to Earth. Is the answer of the question?、Uh, so you've already、mm -hmm. been to the space. That is the, that's the answer. Yes. So that's like a overview effect, right? Once we view Earth as this very fragile single thing, instead of being divided arbitrarily、uh, by the terrestrial、um, borders and concerns, again we obtain this borderless、uh, feeling that the Earth is one holistic whole, is a organism. Thank you very much.、Um, now, and the next question is: What is a comic that you like? What is a comic that I like? Uh, I, I did read the、uh, Attack on Titans. I actually read it over just a couple of days after the final episode uh, gets uh, published because I, I don't usually wait for new installments. So I read as soon as it's、uh, published the entire thing. So it took me like two days、uh, to finish that in one run. I think there's thirty-two volumes or so, and you read it in yes, two days. So, yes. Since I read it very quickly, I don't do much、uh, other than reading the the manga during those two days. <laughs> What did you like about the Attack of Titans? Yeah, I think it's、uh, a, a very serious comic. Actually,、uh, it portrays、uh, not a arbitrarily good versus bad view on things, but shows that on the same historical interpretation, there's many possible vantage points that are, I wouldn't say equally valid, but they are valid in their own right. Yes. Thank you. We will ask you two more questions. What is a game that you like? Magic the Gathering. Aha! We suspected so. Ojai-san, <laughs> I think we,、uh, I think Ojai-san likes that game too. 
、oh, Jason, what is the、uh, you know, nice point about Magic the Gathering?、Uh, we have to do something in only seven cards. <laughs> Wait, what do you think, Audrey?、Uh, that we have to be very creative in just 60 cards.、Uh, uh, 60 pages,、uh, sorry, 60 cards in creativity and 7 cards to combat. Interesting.、Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how it goes. Interesting. We'd like to see both of you、um, playing the game together. Let's play.、Mm -hmm. Sure, let's play. I don't have my deck with me, though, so it'll have to be virtual. Yeah. <laughs> And last year, Audrey, you were saying you like blue, and Ochai san was saying he likes blue and black. So, do you agree? Does that sound typical? So, why is it typical? Blue is an intellectual color. So, how, probability wise, regarding what's coming, do you increase what's coming, or how do you control the game? That's the main focus with blue. And Ochai san, you add black to that. Yes. So I want to chip away at my life as well and、uh, speed it up. That's how I like to do it. Yes. So you both use intellect, and Ochai san is betting his life. Yes, I get pretty close to the edge. Yes, that's right, speedily. That's right. And Tan san, blue, you think blue matches your style as a color? Yes,、uh, and I play blue also in a very slow fashion.、Um, it used to be that、uh, in my deck, the majority is what we call counter spells,、uh, which is、uh, not just we do nothing, but rather the other person does nothing as well. So it's a deck about doing nothing for quite a while. <laughs> I see. I'm not quite sure what you mean by doing nothing, but I'd like to see both of you do it. Yes, doing nothing is actually very important. Why? Well, while you're not doing anything, you have to keep taking from the 60 card deck. And if you take 53 cards, the game is over. So you go to the very limit and do nothing. That's very important. And the more the game proceeds, each turn what you can do increases. So you wait really carefully and take time. I see. So you prepare, and then in the end, you attack. I see. So it's not like if you attack first, you win. Yes, there are three things. Some people attack first and win, or you control, or you use combinations, combos, and you、uh, get the other person with your strategy. And it's the second, the permission type. I see. With table tennis, you're like the cut man. I think I understand. Yes, I think I understand. Maybe I don't, but I feel like I understand. Thank you for your explanation. And I do hope to see the two of you battle it out someday. Tan san, do you believe in fortune telling?、Uh, of course, I believe in any beliefs. Wow, that's amazing. So, if the fortune says something that's unfavorable, you don't mind?、Uh, I wouldn't mind if I don't believe in it because I believe in the power of believing. So, basically, I don't have to believe in any particular thing. As soon as I'm in a state of believing,、uh, then I believe that is what will go i n g to happen. I see. Ochai san was saying he believes in fortune telling as a custom, but not in what's foretold.、Uh, yes, that's right. So they're like computers, really. So you believe in the fact that there's power. If you keep on repeating something, it, became, it becomes a custom. Thank you. Tan san, out of the whole year, what's your favorite day, Audrey san?、Um, well, I would say my birthday, maybe,、uh, April 18th. <laughs> Because I get presents, I guess, and also give presents. <laughs> oh, on your birthday, you give presents? Uh, yeah, uh, basically, uh, it's a、um, hobbit, I think,、uh, tradition from Lord of the Rings. 
By the way, early on, Ochai san was also saying Yoichi was saying he likes his birthday as well. Yes, September the 16th. <laughs> Okay, he was saying he likes um, uh, nine because it's a three squared, and he likes sixteen because it's four squared. <laughs> right. So from here, we'd like both of you to answer the questions. And Ochi-san, I'd like to ask you questions I didn't ask you before. So you were supposed to meet the other day, but you couldn't. If you could really meet face to face, what would you bring as a gift to each other? Audrey-san, what would you bring for Ochi-san? Mm, my undivided attention. <laughs> Ochiai-san, what would you bring? I think I would take a tea ceremony spoon. I would uh, carve it out. Because I learn um, a tea, the tea ceremony, so I take a tea ladle. In Japan, we have thatched roofs. They are traditional roofs. And we sometimes get pieces of wood that have aged for 100 years. And if you use them as a teaspoon, they look really nice as a color. So that's what I'd like to bring Audrey. That's great. So next, let's have you meet in a tea room. That would be good. And Yoichi, would you serve the tea, please? Yes, I'm not very good, but I'd be happy to. Thank you. And if you were able to go to each other's country, where would you take your counterpart? So Yoichi, where would you take Audrey? Let me see. Recently, right now, what feels really Japan would be Kabukicho, maybe? Or Akihabara, maybe? I live in Akihabara. So maybe I would take Audrey to Akihabara, I think. Uh, have you ever been there? Akihabara? No, I, yeah, I have not. Mm -hmm. really? There are electronic parts shows, there's cartoon culture, there's Magic the Gathering. Everything is stuffed in Akihabara, everything Japanese. Yeah, I think I've, I've strolled through uh, it many, many years ago, but I've not spent a lot of time uh, on it, like just as a passerby. So I would be happy to uh, spend more time. Yes, please. And Audrey, if Yoichi came to Taiwan, where would you take him in Taipei or Taiwan? Um, so my office uh, at a social innovation lab, uh, and it's also a park. We tore down all the walls in a previous Air Force headquarters. It's also the cultural lab uh, where we have, for example, the sound speaker configuration that can just close our eyes and be transposed to anywhere in the world through the soundscape and so on. And I have this feeling that uh, you would like it. I'd really love to go. In that respect, maybe Tansan should go to uh, Ochiai san's lab. lab. Uh, yes, please come to my lab at Tsukuba University. There's a lot of strange things there. Mm -hmm. I have second lasers, robots, robot insects. Yes, there are lasers flying around, or there are robot cockroaches. <laughs> Yeah, we've got a lot of robots in the C lab as well. So I think we'll maybe just do lab exchanges. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> yes, that would be fun. And next, I was going to ask you about Magic the Gathering, but you've answered that already, so I will skip that. <laughs> so, if you were able to choose what to put on a new banknote, who or what would you put on that banknote? Audrey-san? After the Tokyo Olympic, there's a lot of people in Taiwan uh, that would really like uh, this uh, design, the tennis court uh, with this label court one in, uh, which is kind of a deciding um, competition uh, in the um, Tokyo Olympics for the Taiwan team uh, to be made part of the coloring uh, of banknotes or really anything that's important. And I uh, also put it on my um, cell phone. Uh, so I think, yeah, it is a something that doesn't use any words, uh, but unites the people in Taiwan together, thanks to the Tokyo Olympic. 
I see. So is that a pattern that's something that derives in Taiwan, or could you explain a little more about the pattern? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so this is a, a, a replay where it showed uh, that the, the lensing uh, on the uh, badminton uh, court is actually a in. Uh, ball, uh, and it uh, decides uh, the outcome uh, of that particular competition. It's a it's a very famous pattern uh, in Taiwan now. Yeah. Oh, I see. So it was in. So it proves that that shot was in the court. I see. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And Yoichi, in your case, what would you put on the new banknote? On a new pen, a QR code. So you could do the blockchain contract address on the QR code. I often lose banknotes. I keep on losing them. And when I take banknotes, um, to pay 10,000 yen, it costs 20,000 yen. That would be nice if you had to print out a note to use it. So basically, if it was in a digital place, you wouldn't be uh, robbed or anything. But I think we need to think about this. Well, even now, there are serial numbers on each banknote, but I think a QR code would be best. Mm -hmm. So it's like a traveler's check, uh, but it's backed by a QR code. Exactly. If you have a QR code, then you can attach the information or the banknote to that person. And if you track that banknote, maybe you can continue to track down who hold uh, that banknote as well in the past. So the next question, was there a book that you would like to recommend that you read recently? Mm, well, um, actually, the book is right under my laptop, uh, and I'm not sure whether I can actually present it without disrupting the, the video, but I can probably try. So, okay. Right, so, um, yeah, so this is uh, Charles uh, Legender's uh, Notes of Travel uh, in Formosa. And I've got both the Mandarin version and the English version here. And it has a lot of very beautiful maps and so on uh, of um, the, his travels in Taiwan. And uh, recently, a novel uh, based on this uh, was introduced as a TV series uh, in Taiwan, the Sikalu. Uh, and again, it won uh, pretty good acclaim uh, on the public TV uh, in Taiwan. So I've been reading kind of the, the source book uh, for that particular novel and the TV adaptation. Interesting. What, what do you see about Formosa or Taiwan through that book? Uh, there's a lot of different uh, cultures around that time uh, that where the indigenous nations, for example, uh, signed a peace accord uh, with the U.S. at the time, uh, which was not taught in the history books uh, back when I was a school children. So I learned to view the same uh, historical period from a lot more different angles and perspectives as compared uh, to the Qing Dynasty angle that I'm more familiar with um, in, in the schools and so on. So I believe it has this transcultural educational pedagogical value uh, for a lot of people in Taiwan to review uh, the history uh, from that particular point of view. Interesting. So, Ochae-san, what is your book of recommendation? Yeah, I will be killing the commendator by uh, Haruki Murakami. So I actually had a, uh, you know, a, a vacation out of the blue, and the main character was actually in a hot spring, and I was also in a hot spring. So I kind of felt some kind of destiny between the main character and myself. I read all the Haruki Murakami books. Um, and it makes me feel like I want to speak Japanese. I like even simple words like I'll eat a sandwich or let's drink coffee. And, and there's just like a very unique way of uh, a Haruki style, let's say. So I like uh, Haruki Murakami a lot. I think there's a lot of things that can be simply explained in English, but uh, I like Japanese as well, especially after reading his books. By the way, Audrey, have you ever read uh, Haruki Murakami before? 
Yeah, one of my favorite novelists uh, when I was 15 or 16. Interesting. A lot of the, a lot of people read his books on like Kafka or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the the first book uh, I read was the the Hard Boiled Wonderland and the End of the World. Interesting. Interesting. Mm. Haruki Murakami. Don't you want to start eat, like, eating sandwiches after reading Haruki Murakami? <laughs> yes, a little bit. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so we have two more questions. Was there something that you couldn't do in 2021 and want to do in 2022? How about you, Audrey? Visit Japan. Visit Japan. <laughs> Nice. Visiting Japan will be our wish as well. Next year, we do really hope that we can meet you in person. I agree. So even in this program, um, it will be really great if we can feature both of you again. By the way, how about you, Ochoa-san? Well, I actually did most of the things that I wanted to do this year. So the world has been um, much easier to live than 2020. I've been making tea. I've been making tea while doing uh, teleconferences. I am living with a cat. Uh, 2020 was not entirely accustomed to the rituals of the online way, but I think it became much more easier to live. It's a pity that I can't go to abroad, but also bringing my exhibition onto abroad, I've been using remote ways and remote instructions. So it has been traveling around me, although I haven't been there. So in that sense, 2021 has been much more convenient to me than in 2020. I would love to go to Taiwan, but I guess, you know, we're not so far away. So I hope I can go very soon. Mm -hmm. By the way, Audrey, is there something that you have uh, seen around the changes between 2020 and 2021? I actually feel that it has become much more convenient, um, you know, compared to 2020 to 2001, and everybody has been more accustomed to the digital. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and all the wrinkles uh, in video conferencing, telemeeting, telehealth, and teleeducation software has been worked out uh, by largely trial and error uh, last year. So by this year, it's a much more comfortable, um, safe space for people to engage each other on the digital spaces. Mm -hmm. If we uh, can slowly go into the main topics of today, what do you think about these changes, Ochoa-san? Well, I think it's about we don't understand the convivial aspects of life uh, unless we meet face in face. It's always important to have that interaction. But also, if you have an intellectual conversation or, um, you know, or in, in other words, connecting the brain and the brain, audiovisual is very strong, but when it, it comes to physical, it's a bit different. If we are a humans, uh, the animal aspect of humans, then we have to meet face to face. But in a way, humanity and the animality, let's say, so to speak, are a bit different. I think human comes in 70% uh, and humanity comes in 30% maybe? Oh, the animal is 30% and the humans are 30%. So I think the animal part has to be uh, comprehended with the convivial aspect of life. So, Audrey, the age that we are able to have this online uh, situation, what do you think uh, is the importance in meeting face to face? Uh, so that we can have undivided attention. Uh, I totally agree that uh, at this moment when we're meeting intellectually over video conference, at most I can muster uh, less than one third of my attention and the other two third is being divided uh, to the camera crew, right, to, to my immediate surroundings and things like that. And I can't help uh, but be divided this way because um, as uh, we have already discussed, the, the animal part and the intellectual part is not in a uh, completed puzzle, right? But once we have met face to face with undivided attention, then of course, when we return uh, to different places and then we rejoin uh, through video conference, we 
can complete the gestalt, right? The uh, uh, unspoken parts uh, together uh, using our mental models of each other, and it will still feel convivial. Of unspoken words, like you mentioned, like meeting the eyes and sensing each other. The, the animal human and the intellectual human and these not being integrated is exactly what I think. When you think of it in a virtual, say, uh, in, a, in a virtual place, it seems integrated, but in reality it is not. So not an avatar, but actually there should be a place where the digital and physical is really merged. That seems to be something as an important uh, topic. I think it's a very important. Uh, it, it is a very important, which Audrey pointed out, between the not in, not being able to integrate the animal aspect and the the intellectual aspect of human. The undivided aspect is very important. Lastly, if you were to express 2021 using one word or one character, what would you use, Audrey? Uh, didn't we do that before last year? So, uh, right. So <laughs> this time, I, I think uh, I'll use use this word. <laughs> Zero again. Yeah. yeah, but it's capitalized, right? The yeah, uppercase, uh, uppercase is here. Right, uppercase. <laughs> Why is it uppercase? Um, as uh, we have seen that uh, our understanding of the digital realm, the zero and one realm, um, has been promoted to a degree uh, where it's now interwoven in our daily life. It's no longer a lowercase zero that seems uh, strange and new, but rather people have accepted that this is part of the normal. I see. That's interesting. And Yoichi, you were saying earlier on, which word would you use? I would use well-being, bountiful. So I hope everyone enjoys well-being. Everyone is starting to choose well-being. And depending on the digital part, before the digital part, where pe the, some people didn't have enough resolution, others did. And then only some people are able to use digital. But now that the infrastructure is ready, schools are using digital, workplaces are using digital. And personally, I am spending my time very comfortably. So I think that the well-being is good. And there's a new kind of well-being that everyone has been able to find. And this well-being, thanks to digital reaching everyone, maybe that's why, uh, yes, there are lots of things like that. So I often do research at university on the diversity of bodies like wheelchairs and artificial limbs and people with seeing or hearing disabilities. So people who have problems regarding mobility, they can work from home. And people who have seeing disabilities, there are lots of reading tools. And people with hearing disabilities, you can add captions for them. So in that way, computing is now closer to human bodies. And the infrastructure is now in place quite a lot. So in daily life, to hold meetings, most of what we need has now become possible thanks to digital tools. I see. So digital has brought about well-being, maybe you can call it that. Yes, digital and the physical have maybe worked together, they have affinity for each other. Or maybe we have become accustomed to it more. That's right. So remote meetings, regarding them as well, like Yoichi and Audrey, you've been using them for a long time, but ordinary people like us, we didn't really use them. But now we're using them every day without thinking about it. So there has been rapid progress. And of course, we should not be happy about COVID-19, but thanks to COVID, things have accelerated, I think. So what do you think, Audrey? Yeah, I think the internet was built for this scenario uh, where people are relatively isolated from one another physically. Of course, they declared uh, that it's a design for a post-nuclear uh, situation, so not exactly the same as COVID-19, uh, but the internet has uh, the definite uh, design sketches and briefs uh, so that it can reconfigure itself as something like this uh, is being required from the international society. So thanks to the internet, we have formed a global neighborhood, not measured in physical distances, but rather in shared experiences and values. 
That's true, I see. My grand, more than my grandfather and grandmother, I meet uh, Yoichi more often than my grandma and grandpa. And uh, maybe we can meet Audrey more often too. Mm -hmm, definitely. Thank you. Now, let's change gears and move into the individual themes. And I'd like to show you a slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't play the first video that you sent me, so it will be my first time. Yeah. I see. So maybe we need to share the videos as well. You weren't able to see it. I see. Sorry. So were you unable to see the long video? Let's. Uh, I. I saw the video about the wedding uh, between uh, seeing impaired people okay. and the work and so on. So that video played fine, but the first one I couldn't play it. There are actually two more videos. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the third one about Albert Einstein's uh, travel to, to Japan, right? That plays uh, okay. So just the first one uh, was missing. I understand. Okay, so later on we'll have you take a look at that. Okay. Um, so, Kak-san, can you hear me? Kak-san? Hello? No? Oh, could you give us a moment, please? So the coordinator, Kak-san, who is on your side, I have sent Kak-san a video over line, and maybe you can look at it on the smartphone. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so can you see the screen that I am sharing? Yes. So we're in year three of COVID-19. We want to think about the children. And actually, before this talk session, we had a briefing with Yoichi. And we said grown-ups regarding wearing masks, the grown-ups understand and they are using the masks. But the children, they're just being told to do so. They're being told to obey and they're just being obedient. I think that's what's happening with lots of children. So maybe we should do something about this. That was the suggestion by Yoichi. And we looked at the questionnaire survey. There's a questionnaire survey like this. Uh, Yoichi, can you see the screen? Actually, the screen is very hard to see. Yeah, I, I tried to pin uh, your screen sharing, and then within just a couple of seconds, it, it's gone. So I'm not seeing anything now. Yeah, it's like a loop screen right now. I'm having problems too. Oh, could you give mm -hmm. us a moment, please? Let's see what we can sure, do. Sure, of course. Yeah, this is the digital equivalent of talking about bad weather. <laughs> like it's raining or something. Oh, it's raining today, that kind of thing. Can you see? That's right. Yes, I can see yes. better. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. It's not the whole screen, but we can see. Yes. Okay, I'm not sure why you can only see, but let's just go ahead with this. So with COVID-19, in Japan, there's the National Center for Child Health and Development, and they've continued to hold questionnaire surveys among children. And the results show that they surveyed around 1,300 children. And do you feel stressed today? 70% of the children said, yes, they feel stress. And back in 2020, at the same time, 73% of children said they feel stressed, so there's not much improvement. And right now, in the red box, can you see, Yoichi, or do you can see? So there are children who say things like this. When will COVID-19 be over? I'm going to be a grown-up in no time. I was born in an era like this. It can't be helped. That's what my parents say. So how can I feel more cheerful, both in mind and body? So in response to this child and for the children who say they feel stress, how can we respond to them? How can we respond to the children? Could you give us some ideas? Audrey, what do you think? Um, this, yeah, uh, 
just before the summer vacation, there was also a couple months uh, that the children in Taiwan were uh, doing teleeducation because a, of a sudden spike. Of course, now we're back at zero COVID. For, so for the next, uh, for the second semester, it's no longer uh, telecommunication. Uh, but it, it was a moment of panic um, during that time. And so what we have uh, said essentially uh, is just to take their time. Meaning that instead of uh, having to complete any assignment over the internet suddenly when the teacher themselves were still uh, being um, adjusted right, to the new communication infrastructure, we need to at, uh, at last uh, let the children uh, take where they want to go in terms of learning, in terms of the project they want to do, or if they just need some time to accommodate to the new reality and so on. Uh, because over the screen, uh, there's really no way to enforce classroom order for those teachers who are still being adjusted uh, to the new uh, situations. Uh, so uh, we have seen a lot of reports that the children are taking more autonomy uh, at deciding what to do with their time, what to do with their class, what to do with the project uh, they want to pursue. Now, of course, they're back to the classroom, but I think these um, couple months of autonomy uh, is actually a empowering experience because whatever isolation and suffering they had, uh, it's not them alone. Everybody else, um, including their teachers, had the same uh, suffering experience. So that could become the social object around which that the children lead the way to how to overcome or adapt to that instead of being taught what's the standard answer uh, to the existing society. Right, so the children have to think for themselves and adapt in their own ways. Mm -hmm. So, Yoichi, what do you think about the children of Japan? They, are, they think that they will become out soon, they have to adapt with the current situation. What would be your answer? Well, let's see. In my time, we had some school trips, excursions, we had some cultural festivals, we had uh, sports festivals, starting from primary school, middle school, and high school, and they were very important events during my youth. When I see my child, my children, I say I call them economical nomads. Uh, there was a media artist, Nam Jun Paik. This is a word that he mentioned. We are living in a certain space, but we are actually economically and digitally moving around, nomads. So we can do online games and always communicating with 10 or 20 people. This is something that we can uh, witness in everyday life. There is a network in a like-minded people and we can become friends with everybody. And I think that has been uh, become much more popular and well seen than my time. But I think there were also an important aspect about being youth is connecting through comics and games as well. Um, and this can be uh, similar to what the youth are experiencing at the moment, but there's also some friendship that can be only bonded through these excursions and travels and events, which can sometimes be, this is something that they are lacking. When we think about the post-COVID culture, this is something that we will be creating. We have to think about the new literature, we need to think about the new drama, games, design, and they will be emerging, and I think there's a lot of chances. So, in other words, if we think from a different perspective, they have been adapting to the current situation much faster than the adults and can think and create about new things. So I actually might, uh, we might actually be envied by the people uh, who haven't experienced this time. I think that is actually a really nice perspective, especially for us who think about the past. We might think about it as uh, we want to go back. I do not want to go back at all. So maybe Ochoa-san might be leading the youth. I just want to be in the meeting while petting my cat. Uh -huh, okay, so uh, we can actually give a message to the children that this is actually an opportunity that we can think new things. Audrey, what's your, what do you say about this idea? 
Yeah, I think it's a really good idea. As I said, the global neighborhood centered around common values uh, allows children to make global impact uh, much better than the previous era where they can make maybe neighborhood impact, right? So I think um, I totally agree that we're now all time zone travelers, if not time travelers, uh, that we can uh, just a little bit adjusting of sleeping pattern enable us to connect uh, to any point uh, on the earth. So planetary scale, uh, scale community I believe, uh, is the reality upon which that our new generation are being uh, contributed upon uh, their own works, their uh, schools, and so on. Uh, they are all taking this initiative digitally. Uh, so as um, I say uh, to many video conference uh, meeting participants, I always say, uh, unmute yourself. And I believe that COVID-19 provides a, a chance for uh, children and really everyone uh, who were previously confined in their neighborhood or communities to contribute to a global community and mute themselves. Interesting. If you mute, we are always silent. But if we have a mute, we have these sounds like ah and the ums. And that's also something of, of contribution. And I think that's very interesting. Especially if education is something that is given, then the the, the the blocks or the differences between co uh, com countries uh, become vivid but if we don't have this then it, you know uh, then we, this community can emerge um so i myself i uh, lost opportunities to go to academic conferences i went to india and i had to take a long way on the plane but now i just have to take one minute to switch from being in japan to india and those kind of opportunities have in increased by the way audrey i think you've been uh, how many countries have you virtually or digitally traveled in the past year yeah, it, I, I lost count. Uh, but physically, it took me back when I was 25 years old, it took me two years to travel to like 20 cities and do some work there on computer science and so on. Uh, but I can probably count 20 different countries that I've been to virtually in just uh, the past couple of weeks. So obviously, uh, it's a very different um, configuration. Indeed, in the physical world, right, there's this idea of attenuation. When when you speak, if somebody is distance away, they can't hear you very well. But I now hear you perfectly. So we're really, indeed, only constrained by uh, our time zones. And um, I nowadays dedicate uh, my uh, 7 a.m., around 7 a.m. time uh, to the east coast of North America and South America uh, and 7 p.m. Uh, to the Europe and uh, Africa and the time in between. Of course, I was just like moving uh, in the time zone. So I always have this uh, idea of me kind of uh, time zone traveling uh, as the day um, revolves um, in, in Taiwan. Uh, I was uh, imagining myself just traveling to different spots in the world. Uh -huh. So I think the, the, the spin of the sun, uh, excuse me, the, the spin of the earth is actually how you go around with the spin of the sun as well. <laughs> If you, if you had a mileage plan, then you will have uh, a lot of mileage points by now. Nice. So, that's a state of emergency. Um, and when we can't access conventional education and how the children react to the situation, and there might be new types of educations that might may emerge. So the first video was uh, is uh, an example of from the past. So we would like Kakusan to show Audrey the video, if possible. Okay, so let me view the video now. Okay, on, on her laptop, I believe. Okay, so we will be showing the video now. So, Yoichi, um, you actually gave the editorial staff, per se, about uh, different topics like uh, education after the plague and so forth. And now we would like to see one example from that time. Okay, so, so just to make sure it's the picture of today video, like this one. Okay, okay. So I, I, I'm now viewing it. Oh, 
の時代から何があったか分からなくなりますあの一般学生にしてですね、それからあの運動指定の学生にしても、それはまだ一応、高齢生になって紹介ですから、もはやどのように関係が変わってしまうのか、やはり高齢生としても違うわけですね。あのだけど、僕たちは、やはり何らか団結できるしな、チームでも主催できるし、非常に良い方なんです。So, we had some themes、um, that were、uh, suggested by Yoichi.、Um, and through the video, I think we,、uh, and about this time where we had the student protest and where the examination programs happened in April,、um, so the, the original Examination was just about memorization, and now it became about writing an essay and really thinking about the messages of and thinking about、um, and examining how the students developed their thought process. I didn't know about that. So, in Japan, the University of Tokyo has very high scores. So, in entrance exams, in the hierarchy, it's at the top. So, many people take the exam. And the list of people who pass has changed. So, before and after the entrance exams were cancelled, the list changed. So, I thought probably something had happened because the list of people who entered was so different. But now I understand. So, The fact that the exams are cancelled means that the high school students were able to raise their voices and change the entrance exam. But you understand how they feel. What do you mean? Well, clearly, everyone was trying to study hard. And this is like an initiation, kind of. So, unless you go through this initiation, you will not be recognized as a grown up. That was part of the education system in Japan. And when you think about that, if that's gone, Then, for them, what they can believe in in society collapses. So, something that collapses like that, being the basis or foundations of being made to obey and being made to participate in society, of course, they're going to be sick of it. 
And yes, so towards the end, they talked about a challenge from a new era. I think that's good. It's 1971, but in 1972, they talked about the limits of growth. The people talked about resources. So when you think about that, the population back then, it was said that the population would explode, explosively increase, and there would not be enough food, and the burden on the environment would be large, which means that just gaining knowledge, memorizing, would not be enough. You need to think about what to do. So the Ministry of Education seems very stuffy, but they came up with the 4-6 report, and this is called a, a really good, it's like a wall that's difficult to overcome. So the country too, the government seemed unable to change, but they were able to change, coming up with the 4-6 report. So they still had energy back then. That's right, Japan still had energy. I see. Now, Audrey, we want to ask you as well. So this kind of anger, so using anger to change society on the part of young people. So in Japan, it's sometimes difficult. It doesn't really happen. People say, even if you're angry, it's not going to change anything. Now, Audrey, in your book, you talk about how the power of anger can be effective. So could you tell us why you say so? Sure. So to channel anger into collective action requires us to think differently about outrage. Previously, people act upon outrage through discrimination, maybe, through revenge, maybe. And these are, of course, very destructive uh, outlets of outrage that does not bring about real change. Uh, but if we channel that outrage, that social outrage, into preventing something bad from happening again, then that uh, change that change everything right the angle of uh, let's prevent something injustice from happening ever again uh, brings out the best of people so that we can become a co-creative culture and community around this very pertinent question of um, feeling of course the suffering together but then channeling the outrage so that we don't have to suffer exactly the same uh, as before So, Yoichi, we were talking about how young people need to think more about solidarity, working together. And TikTok, they tend to consume, they tend to do the same thing, that's what young people are doing. But maybe they can get hints from young people back then, because they could do it, don't you think so? This is actually more than how do we do it. It's more like when the grown-ups don't understand, the young people should take the move and change things. They should take advantage of it. When the grown-ups don't have the answers, it, taking quick action is probably the answer. With an existing system, they're like dikes or castle walls. They're from the ground and they're quite high and they don't move. But if there's an earthquake or if there's a natural disaster, then they will move. In the same way, if the grown-ups cannot imagine something and that happens, then the young people tend to have a lot of power. So, regarding the current situation, grown-ups too do not know what's going to happen with COVID-19. So grown-ups have a weak standpoint. So they don't have strong foundations. So the young people, if they take action, they might win. That's true. So there's an opportunity. That's true. That's interesting. And Audrey, too, I think it was the same. There was the Sunflower Students Movement. And we never thought students would be able to change things like that. But because they were young, they were able to do it. Did you feel that? What do you think? Was it because they were young that they were able to do it? Yeah, certainly. And also, it demonstrates what I mean by demonstrating in a constructive way, right? Because the protest was not to demonstrate against um, the sudden passing of a trade agreement without consultation, uh, but rather is a demonstration with the people to how to deliberate about that very uh, trade agreement uh, with half a million people on the street and many more online. So uh, to prevent something from happening again is not to destroy the parliament building. Uh, of course, that will uh, never lead anywhere, uh, but rather to use the 
occupy parliament uh, building to show uh, what a well-functioning uh, listening and skill um, configuration would be like so that in the future the people who are legislators can feel more naturally in consulting the people before passing anything like that a trade deal right so it uh, leads uh, directly to nowadays this year the open parliament um, national action plan uh, which was signed by the all the major parties in our parliament so it proves that a positive demonstration changes the norm around things. I see. So demonstrations, people come together and they go, ah, but you imagine that. But Audrey, you're talking, saying that hashtag is the same kind of thing. I think you said that somewhere. So you're saying hashtags going forward are going to be very important. So the importance of hashtags, I read in your book, but once again, under COVID-19, when people cannot come together, what do you think about the importance of hashtags? Could you give us some enlightenment, please? Definitely. So through hashtags, people can form communities with complete strangers in different time zones that happens to care about the same thing. So it allows people to discover new friends through shared values and new shared values through those newly made friends. And it can be done in a way without any active curation. Anyone can mutate a hashtag into some even more viral form of hashtag by including the old hashtag and the new one together in the same posting, right? So it also allows ideas to evolve over time to find a common ground uh, between the different kinds of communities. So it also has what we call network making power. I see, I understand. So that kind of thing, Yoichi, the young people seem to be very good at that kind of thing. Uh, yes, in the olden days, when we didn't have digital uh, movements, you had to get together physically. You had to use physical force to do something. That was all that you could do. But what's interesting about hashtags is they are hyperlinks. And with hyperlinks, a collection of hyperlinks. So the hyperlink before and the hyperlink afterwards, you can rewrite them. And this is, you don't have to be in the same place, you can stay linked or connected and you can overcome time and space. And even if these spaces are not synchronized, you can still get the hyperlink. So it's very internet-like, it's very web-like. You see, you can change the link. So what links are happening, depending on the, the human's intellectual productivity changes. So with papers, it's important to quote with culture, it's important what you inherit. And with entertainment, it's important what you are influenced by and what you influence. So the substance is the link structure, the network, which means that the power of words and linking links, the hyperlink, is perfect. I see. So going forward, the young people will be linked through hyperlinks. Yes, hyperlinks are good. It's difficult to do things any other way. Oh, with images, it's difficult to do things with images. So with words, words still have power. That's interesting. Thank you. So I think I was able to hear lots of good things about education. So maybe we should move on. So after the tests, well, education, the word education is actually not a very good word. Uh, because learning might be better rather than education. Right. So it shouldn't be education. If you're learning, why do you say that? Because education is like initiation, like I said before, or a, a common foundation of society is going to be installed in people. But they don't have to be installed, I think. You should voluntarily go after it. Yes, that's very interesting. Right. So it can actually change. Fully, to fully learn um, is only ha happened after the, the COVID-19. Nice. So, regarding not education, but actually learning, we'd like to talk about the intellectual responses after the plague. We found an interesting paper which we would like to show, but somehow it's not showing at the moment. Please give us a moment. Somehow my sharing system is not working. Hmm. I think you just have to share the desktop again and then enlarge the screen maybe. So sorry, one more minute. 
デスクトップ。<笑>私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たかっこいい。ううなそう。Let's see at the educational and intellectual responses after the plague. There was an interesting paper from the Duquesne、um, University. So, the, I have a question, actually, a quiz for Yoichi. <laughs> Plague from 1346 to 53, it、um, decreased the population to one third. I think you know about this very well. There is something related to intellectual culture that has grown. What do you think it is? Dance, paintings, portraits. There has been something that were only 30 in the past 300 years, but it has grown for to up to 50. Maybe, ah, it's clocks, clock towers. Something close to clock towers. Audrey, do you have an idea? Something no, that I'm increased. Still, I, I'm still reading the paper. <laughs> reading the paper. Amazing. Or is it fountains? Can it be fountains?、Mm -hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm going to show the. Wow, you're reading the paper. That is amazing. I'm actually very surprised.、Um, I think it has 100 pages, maybe.、Mm -hmm. But、uh, I'm going to show you the answer. It's universities.、Mm -hmm. So, there are only 258 years,、uh, in the past 258 years, there are only around 30 universities. But in the post plague era, 12 universities were added, and after that, it kept on increasing. And it was only existing in the Mediterranean areas, but it also started to be、uh, established in Prague, in Vienna. And, a lot, and in this paper, it expresses the influence of the plague. Why so? There was this sense of retrieving something that has been lost, and there was a king that specifically spoken about this, so he started to uh, establish uh, a lot of universities around his area. And now we would like to cite from his sayings. Which we will see on the screen. I think we can't see the screen at the moment.、Uh, let's see if we can move the screen to show the quote from our king.、Mm, somehow it's not moving well today. It is a rainy day. <coughs> is there a way for me to not show the screens? Ah, so I think we can see. Okay. So these are the quotes. Most famous knowledge has not been dragged down to the pit throughout the world's crimes by the odious madness of pestilence. So, well, we had,、uh, so, I think there were many people and leaders who began to think about what should we make after such a catastrophe. And then Carl IV from the Holy Roman Empire thought to make universities. And actually, after that, after the plague, although people,、uh, a lot, many people died,、um, the In the Europe,、um, there were many universities which influenced the Renaissance. So, the state of emergency, the youth began to lay importance in learning about the cutting edge, and the king actually thought in the same way. So, Yoichi, you are a teacher at a university. Do you, I think、uh, you know, we, we wanted to bring this example to、uh, highlight your perspective on the importance of the higher education as well. What do you think about this? Well, 
It's not about giving education. It's about a place to make a dialogue with the people who are doing the most cutting edge or tackling the most cutting edge topics. When you think about uh, the textbooks, you have to learn what is already set. And maybe that could happen if you were an undergrad. But it's not about explaining the textbook. There are things that are not on the textbook or almost going to be on the textbook. And it's about the dialogue that happens in that periphery. And that's the most important part. When we say about the current function of universities and compare it with the past uh, universities, it was the point was about talking with Socrates or with Aristotle. So there is a big difference in, in the culture between the universities back then and the universities of the current. And it's more about in the past, it was more about the joy of the intellectual and the knowledge, but now it's more about preserving and documenting. In my head, I have an image of a library. So when we think about the accumulation of knowledge and the importance of it, at the age where people Many, many people have lost their lives. The importance of sharing such knowledge through the accumulation seems to be more important. When we think about the cutting edge learning and laying importance at the time of emergency, what do you think about this perspective, Audrey? I think, <clears throat> sorry. I think of the open access movement and how the cutting edge researchers and their institutions uh, freed up from copyright intellectual property, everything related to COVID-19, so that people can develop vaccines at an unprecedented speed and also understand the virus and its mutation much better. So I totally agree that this is not about kind of answering the textbook examinations 100% right from the existing walls of of libraries, of texts, and things like that, but rather having everything published related to epidemiology uh, and prevention of epidemics uh, to be active participants in the creation of new knowledge and precisely because it's of common urgency to all. And I think this common urgency is what enabled the open access movement to basically revive and grow uh, through our collective will to survive and build back better, I guess, uh, in a resilient fashion. Mm -hmm, I see. Sharing knowledge and learn and grasping the cutting edge through open access. This is not a critique, but when we think about Stanford University, where they have to pay a very, a very expensive tuition and learning the cutting edge, that's one way of learning. Um, and I think there is some degree of respect towards that sense of uh, cutting edge. But at the same time, we need to think about how to open and democratize this open access towards the cutting edge information, I think. Well, we always say that we are in the uh, ivory tower and you know, we, we professors are living in the ivory tower. And I think there was uh, some sort of truth in that. But when we think that of how many people are reading papers and doing peer reviews and having a much more in-depth knowledge due to this open access. What I want to say here is, I don't think knowledge can be understood easily. Uh, well, actually, excuse me. There was, I think there are increasing number of people who think that knowledge can be understood easily. But you know, it, it was first of all hard to access papers, but now it has become much more easier to access papers, which kind of cre creates a misunderstanding that knowledge can, although it's accessible, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's understandable. So there's a lot of uh, junior high school students who read uh, papers that cannot be understood by adults, for example. That has been preserved in the ivory tower, but now it's becoming a alive 
paper or live study. And I think this is one influence from the COVID as well. What is effective? And after that, the, you know, uh, if there are misinformation about how the vaccination is in, uh, um, is actually effective or not. This kind of information is not provided from the ivory tower. Regarding the COVID-19 um, vaccination information, it was spread very fast. And also the misinformation was uh, corrected very, at a very fast time. When there is, uh, when there was, uh, when such misinformation were corrected properly, then that accumulates in that way as a verification method. But on the other end, if there are um, some misinformation uh, that are not verified, then that also is accumulated at that spot as well. So I think we have to deal with this situation too. Thank you, so in that respect, let me share the screen again and see if I can do that. Here we go. Hope this works. Yes. I apologize for the slow screen. So in that respect, children who feel stress, there were 70% of them. But on the other hand, doing lessons online, more than 50%, 53% said if you had to say they were happy to be receiving online classes. And to be more specific, the reasons were you can be connected in a way that's different from before. Or when you make presentations, you don't have to feel tense. Or uh, I'm not going to school right now, so I can catch up. Or I'm transgender, and I don't have to wear the uniform skirt. So there were children who said this. So this kind of new things, new learning methods, and children becoming accustomed to this so, like Yoichi was saying, it's very close to what you were saying, but going forward, so children are back in school. So, how can we aim for a hybrid thing in a better way? Yoichi, what do you think regarding aiming for hybrid? Well, aiming for hybrid is difficult, I think, personally, because in one classroom, it's going to be difficult. So, rather than go hybrid, in the region, it's okay to have online schools and physical schools and be free to go to either that you want to go to. That should be the way that makes it easier to form the curriculum. So the online children and the physical classroom children, treating them in the same way is difficult. So let's ask from online. You can change the phase. You have to do that uh, to give people the, uh, the opportunity to speak up. So recognition-wise, it feels a bit uncomfortable. Animal-wise, you don't really understand. But intellectually, you understand how it moves forward. That will be the situation, which is not very good, which means that everyone maybe should be taken online, and then there should be the physical locations. And maybe by semester, you should be able to go back and forth. So the way you create the classrooms needs to be redesigned. And by the way, with the seminars or with the lectures, you do both. like like the seminars face-to-face -face and the lectures online, or uh, I do everything online. Uh, well, you can physically do the experiments or have um, a sleepovers or having boot camps. Physical is better. You can communicate much more. But other than that, everything should be online. Intellectually, it's, easy to, it's easier to do. Audrey, <laughs> so learning too, online, there's a lot you can do. In the case of Japan, the online period was quite long. So lots of children, 50% say online is better. And I think you can probably see, there are children who say they don't like it. They prefer face-to-face, -face, about 40%. And Yoichi was saying, maybe we should just separate the schools. Maybe that's viable too. Audrey, what do you think? Well, I think every child has different uh, preferred methods of learning. There are people who are very hands-on and require uh, this social relational context uh, in order to make sense of the knowledge. And there are people who are highly symbolic, who prefer a more abstract way of uh, consuming the, the same information and so on. Uh, and so I, I think it ultimately boils down uh, to the freedom uh, to design the way to interact uh, with each other. And this is what I call assistive intelligence, right? It is not a uh, AI 
AI in terms of an authoritarian top-down way of requiring everyone to adapt uh, to the pace of technology, but a series of um, components like Lego blocks and so on. So everyone in the classroom should feel comfortable to collaboratively design their interaction patterns together using well-known um, blocks that they can set up themselves without being uh, overdetermined uh, by any top-down educational uh, planner. So I, I do believe that this assistive tool chain based way of learning uh, is what makes sense to the group uh, makes sense. If you had to say, we talked about online, but if the children are allowed to choose, they probably will be able to choose, I think. Yes, I think they can choose. They can do that. That would be interesting too, right? So, I prefer the physical, I prefer the online, or this semester it's going to be physical, this semester it's going to be online. Is that what you're saying? To be honest, so children, physically, um, they enjoy the physical, they have a good time, and keep that part physical, and then take everything else online, then I think people will be convinced. Make the fun part physical, keep it physical. So there's the physical learning and the intellectual learning and the parts that's fun, they're different. So PE and uh, crafts, that should be physical. And eating lunch together too is important, I think. So what do you need to share? We need to think about that a little more. That's true. But having said so, with an ordinary class, just seeing each other eye to eye is fun as well. And recently, the students speak to each other. Before, we were not allowed to chat during class, but now children talk to each other. I understand, thank you. Right. So let's end that theme and move on. And we're very happy you have a lot of time. Let's do just one more block and then take a break. Mm -hmm. Now next. <laughs> so this is not the opposite, but aging. Aging actually could be an opportunity. So we're going from children to elderly people. In Japan and Taiwan, aging is moving forward, and in Japan, from 2022, uh, the baby boomers are going to have the largest share of society, they're 75 years old, and the insurance burden is getting larger, and the population is decreasing, so welfare, the economy may break down. Lots of people have a bad scenario they depict. But on the other hand, Yoichi was saying, around the year 2100, um, when you think about the world, the fact that Japan is now seeing a declining birth rate is a good thing, and we ran out of time. So when you think about the year 2100, specifically, what good points are there about Japan seeing a declining birth rate and aging? So Yoichi, around the year 2100, you were saying? Uh, yes, Japan is now seeing a declining birth rate and uh, may be a good thing. Well, all over the world, countries are seeing a declining birth rate and declining population. So the life infrastructure, once it's in place, it's going to be statistically wise, it's going to be supported around that time, 2100, which means globally, Japan has experienced aging first. And Italy maybe, and Germany as well, they're experiencing this ahead of the others. So countries like this, regard in an aging society, how do you redo the infrastructure? When you think about that, I think it's an opportunity. And probably, and depends on how you think about this, the environment, the environment or lifestyles, depending on this, human beings have probably changed the number of people that exist. In the 21st century, the population has continued to increase, and a scenario where the population decreases is also possible. So the, we'll see a kind of a... Uh, a contraction of the population and the burden on the environment, once the population is at an appropriate scale, uh, people start to think about that to alleviate the burden on the environment, which means when that happens, we see a certain level of aging and the aging. Uh, in a cycle of 100 years, 200 years, the pyramid will probably stabilize, which means that I think we are now at the entrance of that. So the next several hundred years, probably is the entrance period. So, doing this ahead of the others means that we understand a lot of things and it may make things fun.
So relatively speaking, supporting that kind of thing, nursing care, welfare, people tend to think about this as a burdensome, but there may be business opportunities. That's what you're saying, Yoichi. And from Japan, there are things that we can discover. So you do research. Oh, me. Well, um, I am interested in people with disabilities, impairments and welfare. So I'm not quite sure if the Japanese brand will sell. Lots of countries have their own local issues that they are trying to support locally. But having said so, from that perspective, the interesting inner growth, the inner demand, will become more lively with certainty and this will create new industries there's no mistake there i see as yoichi was saying we heard from him for a bit of a long stretch and taiwan actually maybe second to japan you're seeing aging society and a declining birth rate and some people think of this as negative but in one respect when you think about the history of mankind maybe taiwan is ahead and maybe new industries can be born that's what yoichi was saying so regarding this audrey what do you think well, Taiwan uh, is one of the most dense uh, places uh, in the world when it comes to population. So it's very easy to overtax uh, the environment. So uh, we have this idea, of course, of an Earth overshoot day, right? So uh, every year before the end um, finishes, we use up the regenerative resources that Earth could produce and that's as a planet. Uh, and so, of course, a lot of people working on regenerative economy uh, circular economy and so on, uh, try to kind of uh, reduce the energy use and so on, so it's more effective. But if the population continue to grow exponentially, then it creates a natural tension with the nature, of course. So I do think that a declining population uh, gives the environment more breathing room, uh, so to speak. And it also makes it much more possible to think of a truly regenerative economy instead of caving in to this idea that uh, the population is ever growing, so must the GDP, so must the exploitation of nature and so on. I understand. In a way, you both think about the necessity of the declining population. When we think about the ancient times, and when we think about the areas that we were huntsmen or uh, nomads, the 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 burden of the nature actually did define the number of humanity as well at a time of emergency is this something that we need to think about it well maybe i am reacting to that but mm, maybe not on the other hand there is a point when i think when we think about the decline of population this is a perspective based on a agricultural and industrial society there are not so many people so for example if we think of this from an information society if there are less people on the land then that will become more that will enrich the society machine doesn't break down so easily so there will be labor that is not human that means if that machine can be possessed by a few people then we can live a richer life by sharing more productivity with a small number of people we don't need a large factory it's about a commons if a commons is only sustained by human then we have to have a lot of human but this is but the commons is actually not only sustained by humans for example internet computer robots hardware water supply uh, hydro electricity uh, generators and there's all of these things are supporting our commons so in that way not growing too much and converging to a certain number is the natural state of human it's exactly so if we have a fewer number of people and think of the productivity from that perspective and build a system then new ideas will come out and we will be able to shape the society in that form 
understood. Thank you very much. In that sense, the aging society will arrive and we will live probably 100 years. And how do we live? These are the topics that have been uh, discussed everywhere, I guess. And there was an example, actually a role model that uh, Yoichi has uh, shared with the editorial team. So we'd like to share with you as well, Audrey. This person is called Gakyo Rojin Manji. Um, we will translate him as Picture Mania Grandpa, aka Manji. Maybe you might know this person. This is his nickname. As known as Katsushika uh, Hokusai. So this person has lived in the 18th century and he lived longer than the average uh, age. He lived until 89 years old. When he was in his 50s, almost reaching his 60s, I'm sorry, excuse me, it's actually when he was me reaching his 30s, he left a very interesting work. He started to call himself by a different name. Okay, just From the age of six, I had a penchant for copying the form of things, and from about 50, my pictures were frequently published. And when I was in 73 years old, I somewhat have, um, was able to start to draw plants and trees that last, and I will probably be able to uh, draw things better when I'm 90, and maybe when I'm 100, I will be able to draw something like God. So I would like to have my uh, an opportunity from, given from God in able for, to, so I will be able to draw something that is very uh, divine. So first of all, uh, Yoichi, can you explain to us why you like this person? Wow. Well, if you go, uh, if you proceed to life, then you will be able to uh, increase your ability or realize new values, and that will go on forever. And I think this is a very positive perspective. Well, I'm not sure if young is the right word, not not in the uh, sense of age, but it's actually about the vivid. He's vivid. He has a lot of liveliness. I agree with you. Audrey, I think on uh, the other day you had, or you, you published a book, and if you are to live until 100 years old, I think you have you mentioned that you have another 30 years old of working. If you even if you retire at 65 and you have 30 years after that, what is your image of um, working after retirement? Well, uh, I think the point here is that one should be able to explore different trajectories uh, in terms of the style of creation, the preferred media, the preferred field in working and things like that. And of course, retirement, uh, when used in this way, is just uh, to represent the freedom to move. But of course, a lot of working age people nowadays, because they're teleworking, uh, they are able to create new windows anyway, uh, even during the, the day's work. Uh, that actually is one very powerful argument uh, for teleworking because it enabled people to connect different fields together on their own personal computing environments instead of having to kind of cave to the predefined logic of their workplace. So basically what I was trying to say through that is just that if you have more time in your hands to plan your own life trajectory, then it will intersect with more places. I understand. I guess Japan, we enter uh, co companies in 22 and retire at 60. I think there's many people who are stuck to this idea still. So if we can live until 60 or 100 or 90 or 100, what do you, th uh, Yoichi, what, what do you think is an ideal design? Well, I think Audrey and myself, we think the same way, but I don't think we have a, a specific 
attachment to the social system. You know, our, our, our what we do doesn't change. Uh, it changes as the time goes by. So there's not a specific age that we are aiming. For example, if it's me, I'm an artist, so I make art, I make papers, I talk with people, and I converse with society. And this is this, this is not because I have a label that I'm 22, that I'm something else. That doesn't really matter. If I'm 10 years older than now, maybe I might have a more deeper sense or nuance in my words but there's not so much it's just about the parameters it's not something uh, defining of who i am and what i do when you say that your age that age is only but a parameter what do you think about what, what do you mean by this can you explain to us a bit more it's just well parameters let me explain parameters so red black yellow blue this is you know for example if we're talking about a color of a car this is just an attribution um, I think the, uh, the age is something like this as well. So Audrey, you, do you think also age is only but an attribution, that like a color of a car? What do you think? Yeah, definitely. And through the internet, there really is no way to tell the other person's age. <laughs> True, we don't need it, actually, don't we? One more thing, um, I think you wrote in your book, Audrey, your own, you wrote about wisdom work by sharing, to share your knowledge and experience to other people from, and, you know, can you give us an example of a specific wisdom work that you have? Maybe it can be like an academic, it can be, but it can be anything. Can you give us an example for us? Well, the first thing came to my mind uh, was that uh, I visited uh, a week ago uh, a senior high school in Bansal. And as usual, I set up Slido, which is a way for the students uh, in one classroom with me and the other six classrooms uh, through te telepresence, uh, video conference. Uh, they can uh, basically all ask me questions anonymously and also vote on each other's questions. And before long, the top question raised by an anonymous student was, uh, why is the school giving Audrey this kind of bubble tea encased in plastic with the plastic straw? I thought uh, on Audrey's uh, platform, we already banned plastic straws uh, from the takeouts. Now, uh, then I promptly uh, discarded um, the, the straw, which I wasn't really using anyway, uh, and uh, started drinking directly uh, from, from the cup. Uh, and it, it's very interesting because uh, if we say uh, on the classroom attending a lecture, you can only raise your hand to speak up, uh, that probably will not appear because uh, the person who raised their hand will have to take a tremendous risk because they didn't know that the entire classroom uh, is thinking the same uh, thought, right? Uh, but through this digital reflective medium, uh, a anonymous idea can resonate with one another. So it feels like a collective intelligence uh, is speaking to me. And by taking a response in the here and now I'm basically saying oh here here let's make the this the, the new norm and uh, of course the uh, teachers, uh, the principal, and so on, uh, all learned about this particular signal uh, from their students. And in a way, uh, that is unmuting themselves, even though it's just through words and not literally uh, speaking through sound. And I think that's, that's wisdom work because it produced a new habits, a new norm on the spot through collective action. I see it's true. So that is age has nothing to do with it. They're all just parameters. And what you say is the only thing that is focused on. And in that respect, I think that's a very important discovery and statement. Uh, yes, you were talking about unmute. I think that was the most interesting. Because children are muted. Children are forced to be muted. So unmuting their way of thinking, they start to talk. And online, elementary school students or junior high school students, when you do classes with them, you can tell. Compared to a grown-up, uh, they talk much, much more than the grown-ups. This is very important. So as the way of thinking, unmute them, and you'll get a lot of information from them. In the classroom, classrooms mute children. It's a system for muting children. 
when you unmute them, they become much more energetic. That's very important. So you don't have them to show their faces, right? They don't have to show the video because sound and writing, people understand at the same time. In the past, there was verbal plus a sound. That was all, that was the form of communication. You type in sentences, you type in words, communicate and then speak using audio. That's fine. Which means, that's why some children are able to speak up, not just children, but many people will be able to speak up. That's true, who are unable to speak before. Yes, that's right. That's true. It's a digital meeting. So if Audrey and Yoichi, if the two of you were to meet face to face, I could not cut in. But because it's digital, I can cut in. That's true, because it's digital, I can cut in. Thank you. So we've gone on for a long time. Let's take a five minute, no, 10 minute. Let's take a 10 minute break. And we will reconvene at 25 minutes past. So we have an eight minute break. Okay, let's take a break. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I will switch this off because it's not working well. Let me redo this. <笑>先生啊 需要吃一点巧克力吗？可以啊，我带巧克力。好，那我直接打开包。好，不用那么多，一个就好，谢谢。
信心。<咳>对，这样就好，真的真的。OK， 谢谢。嗯，不是，这是带来给您的。嗯嗯嗯。所以我把放这里。好。圣诞节快乐。谢谢。嗯，还有那个左边的刘海，你帮我吗？我自己看不到了，也是。耳入ってる耳<笑>ちょっと待って、はい、なんか、はい、始まってから言います
はい、聞こえます。はい、はい、ありがとうございます。はーい。はい。はい。えー、業務連絡でございます。タンさんのお茶屋さんもすいません。えっと、共有はうまくできるようになったので大丈夫です。あ、so we have good news、はい。We are Now able to properly share our screen. We have solved the problem. We actually had a few misunderstandings, but we are now cooling. So,、mm -hmm. okay, excellent. We've got sunshine, then the rain is over. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we hope we indeed don't need an umbrella. So, ちょっと。Yes,、uh, and that, that's indeed the sound of the ambulance. <laughs> It shows the urgency for the partnership, I'm sure. <laughs> Wonderful, exactly. I think that is what it is. Um, so now we would like to go. In the end, about partnership. So it has been a year since we last spoke. And Yoichi and Audrey, you both had very unique activities. So let's look at one example as Yoichi's activity in the past year. So, I think、uh, you said that you've been, we were able to see the, the, the video, the second video with the wedding.、Yes. Okay, so now we'd like to. So we'll now, let, now would like to look at it together. So let's review, Yoichi san, about your activity. Yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a work that we've been doing in my lab. This, was, this went viral in Japan as well. Students did a very hard work.、Uh, I actually just said, you know, if I projected the subscription to、uh, the subtitles on a the screen, then everybody was like, oh, that's interesting. And then they started to take lift from there. The point here is that the, the, there are small words that are mirrored beneath. That, is, that was the most important point. This fashion show was really nice. Humans are diverse. So we had this、uh, main person, Ototake san,、uh, appearing in several of my projects, but this was also、uh, featuring him. This was done by a miraculous schedule, miraculous casting, and miraculous timing. This was my student, my lab student. So, Mr. Iwata is our friend, and he is a low vision. So, you know, weddings are very hard to see if you're a low vision. Congratulations, I'm a media artist. I'm Mio Ichi Uchiai.
あのオードリーさん、so, Audrey, 去年は y さんが何をしているかということは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、Over individuating themselves trapped、uh, within technologies. We work instead on technologies that are brought to people so they can decide how to use. So, in a sense, it is design, but lowercase d, right? So, it's not an uppercase design that try to impose a new sense of normal, but rather to provide for the people so that the people closest to the pain can be re enabled. And in this sense, I think it's just like my. Favorite <laughs> technology, right? <laughs> Which is my eyeglass、uh, that、uh, enables me、uh, to be a fully participating community member. It's not here just for me alone, but also so that we can have this conversation together. So, you said prost-、uh, so、Yoichi said prosthesis will become like glasses. Or even、um, uh, hearing devices as well. Or these. So, glasses can,、uh, is just very simple, just about the glass and how to adjust the light. But when it becomes about hearing, it becomes about computational simulation and how do we.、Uh, Capture the right wavelength and how do we communicate it and adjust it in the movements、um, of humanity and other sounds that can be heard? So, I think there are、uh, so many differences within glasses or prosthesis and those kind of tools. So, Yoichi, you mentioned that technology,、uh, so Audrey mentioned about you know,、um, the, the assistive technology and intelligence、um, and the freedom. So, when people can,、uh, are allowed to have more choices, that's the most important thing. Something that, is, that we shouldn't be do, doing、um, in assistive technology is to assimilate to the non disabled. For example, low vision has a low vision culture, the, the deaf has a deaf culture. If DHAs have their own、uh, culture, all of these are important. For example, if the hand language、uh, becomes sign language, becomes、uh, um, all subtitles, then it somehow loses its culture. So, not to assimilate is something that、uh, you value highly. Yoichi. So, one of the things that you mentioned is we, we shouldn't be happy with just being diverse, but we also need to think about inclusi inclusivity. Yes, inclusivity is important. But inclusive means that we need, always need to think about the people who are not included. That's the most important part. Where do you think the danger lies? In that,、um, when people think. <laughs> But when people state that it, it's inclusive, they really think that it's inclusive. But there is always something that is not included in the inclusivity. So we always need to think about the outside. We won't be able to think about the outside. We can't complete the world. If the world is complete, then we always will not think,、uh, we will never think about the, the things that are outside. Inclusivity is a direction, not a state. That's very interesting. It's not about, okay, we're in a certain state, so it's inclusive. No, that's not the goal. Are you still eating pigs, for example? Are you still eating pork? Or are you still producing carbon dioxide, for example? So, you know, Audrey, you were also talking,、uh, you also use the term diversity and inclusivity, inclusivity a lot.、Um, what, what do you think about、uh, Yoichi's idea that there always might be somebody who is not included? Yeah, definitely. And I think mostly about people who are not even yet born or people who we don't yet consider as peoples, 
right? Uh, like a uh, natural personhood, uh, where a river, a mountain, an ecosystem, um, a forest is considered as peoples in now in some jurisdictions like New Zealand. Uh, but when we uh, do not yet give them the right to vote and so on, uh, then they by nature does not exist on the diversity spectrum. So they're, they're hidden, they're muted, uh, so to speak. So if you say that you're 100% inclusive, uh, you're by definition saying we're excluding um, the peoples that are currently unmuted, maybe because they are not considered as people, maybe because they've not yet been born. But really, those are the people who are going to suffer the most if we pollute the environment or the society, or they're the ones who are going to be the most creative when responding to the new emergent issues when we're all like 100 years old. It's going to be those new generations of younger peoples determining um, the direction of the humankind and beyond, right? So to be inclusive to newer possibility that we cannot fathom, I believe that is the direction of inclusivity. I see. So, with a crisis like COVID-19, we say, okay, now we've overcome the problem, we've now reached our goal. We tend to think so, but that's not what we should do. I think both of you agree. You seem to resonate, and that's some food for thought for us. Thank you. In that respect, in Japan, what Audrey is doing, so, there are things that you do that are known, that are very famous, but there are also uh, viewers who do not know, so we'd like to introduce what you've been doing. In Taiwan, last year, on August the 28th, at that time, you had zero people infected, and the seven-day average was zero. Regarding COVID-19, you were very successful in containing this. But from there, in May, you saw the infection spread. And in two months, you had 10,000 people testing positive. Regarding this, including Audrey, regarding what everyone did, uh, what you did attracted a lot of attention. One thing is uh, you created a system for tracking the contact history. So you can scan QR codes and you can tell everyone's uh, contact history. And by this, you're able to contain a lot of the infection. And another thing is you were able to make bookings to be vaccinated very easily. You can do that at a convenience store, for example. And through this, we saw a big decrease in the number of people testing positive, and you were able to contain the infection, and that was amazing. So in this way, in countries that were successful in containing the virus, when you see a sudden spread, what you think about is uh, having a very tight lockdown or um, restricting the movement of people. You tend to think so, but you did not do that. You used apps instead. So I think you're being very thorough. So why did you not think about a strict lockdown or things like that? Could you let us know? Certainly. <clears throat> Sorry. Certainly. Um, we didn't introduce any new apps in response to the surge because we've never declared a state of emergency. And from the experience of last year, we understand that people will only change their behavior if they understand very well all the components related to that particular measure, which is why we chose SMS, which is why we chose QR code, which is why we say, instead of downloading any app, just use your cell phone's camera, which is why we say, if you can't scan the QR code, just manually text the 15 digits um, to the well-known number 1922 and so on. And all this is just to build a norm on top of which everyone can be creative in a practical way. So rather than any top-down, lockdown, uh, shutdown, takedown um, measures, what we have trusted is the collective intelligence of people to understand understand the new variants at that time alpha and later on delta and that we need to shorten the time it takes to do contact tracing from over 24 hours to maybe less than 24 minutes in order to make sure that the R value can be controlled uh, to be under one uh, in that example. So we basically trusted the public, the citizens to come up with innovations. So I must say that the 192 SMS contact tracing is not my idea. Um, it's 
benefits again from two civic technologists in the GovZero community and supported by tens of thousands of developers in various different teams. So, Yoichi, as Audrey was saying, top down, lockdown, shutdown, that's not what was done. So, you believed in people. That's what Audrey was saying. And maybe you can do it because it's Taiwan. Or could we do it in Japan? So, what do you think? Of course, uh, Taiwan does have a large population, but Yoichi? Well, in Japan, Japan is unique again. But in Japan, I think we can believe in the people. But what's strange is, in our country, the number of um, people infected is small, but we still wear masks. So rather than trust the people, I think it's the atmosphere that allows us to uh, make things uh, best. But the air in Japan can be relied, I think. It's an index that can be relied on. The collective mutual watching or mutual monitoring. I think Japan is very strong regarding this. And that is doing very trustable moves, I think. Reliability is high. So in that respect, a top-down lockdown is not being done in Japan either. So no lockdowns. The individuals do not break away. So substantially, I do feel that their freedom is being restricted. However, there are no laws or regulations that restrict the freedom of people. We just request people. So it's good and it's bad. I see. And depending on the country, the response is different. In Taiwan, the people in Taiwan and Japan too, seen from the rest of the world. Regarding COVID-19, Taiwan and Japan have managed to respond in a good way. And this know-how, how should I put this? Not just Japan, but communicating this, I think is important. And Audrey, too, you, so you have been offering help, but it's not really spreading. Why do you think that is? Well, some of it is spreading, right? Uh, the general acceptance of the mask, if properly worn, coupled with hand washing and so on, uh, is still very important uh, to any variant of the virus. That is something that we've said in the very, very beginning, along with the uh, people in Japan. And now the world is uh, listening, uh, like finally. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the importance of uh, people basically um, looking at each other, reminding each other to take care of each other instead of uh, prolonged lockdown, which caused fatigue and so on. I think that that is also now generally accepted uh, by the epidemiologists and so on. So I wouldn't say that uh, those ideas were not spreading. While, of course, uh, in many different countries, maybe the governments could not trust the citizens to the same degree like we do in Japan, where the citizens co-create the mass distribution system, the SMS contact tracing system, and so on. Still, this idea that uh, communicating properly so that people have general epidemiological knowledge instead of just a top-down uh, rule for people to obey. I think that idea has gained foothold. I see. It's true. You have the right not to wear a mask. When people say so, how do we respond? There are not many people like that in Japan, but if someone says that to you, I mean, are there people like that? Yes, there are people who say that. I have the right not to wear a mask, but probably the atmosphere, the air, they're going to be criticized, or on SNS, they're going to be very, very criticized and bashed. But substantially, voicing your opinion, it's your right to do so. You have the freedom to do so. And someone else criticizing you is not really right. But because of pressure like this, if that suppresses the number of people infected, maybe that's allowing us to stay healthy. But maybe we are unhealthy in a different sense of the word. I see. Yes, so air, atmosphere is interesting. So it's not clearly written. And things that are not clearly written, we respond in a very animal response kind of way, I think. I understand. 
Uh, I would say that uh, diversity uh, helps also in Taiwan because rather than everybody wearing the same kind of mask, we talk about a pink mask episode. And after that, people wear a mask as a sign of self-expression. I can say uh, I like the presidential hackathon, the SDGs. It actually visualizes all the 17 SDGs in this mask. Or I can say I work in the cabinet building and this is a picture of the cabinet building or <laughs> things like that. So, so people uh, take to the mask as a way to be unique as well. So they can still kind of unmute themselves, so to speak, uh, by showing their uh, uniqueness in supporting uh, the pink mask, the rainbow mask, and things like that. And I think that also convinces people who even the, the most uh, unique people to still wear a mask uniquely and protect themselves against their own unwashed hands. By the way, Yoichi, you said that masks have become somewhat comfortable. Yes, I started to use something very comfortable. In my, in my sense, I have a zipper in the middle, so it opens up like this. It actually opens too much, maybe, but uh, it's a very strange mask that I like. You know, if it opens up, it doesn't really have a meaning, but I still like it anyway. It's free. It kind of gives me some freedom, so that's why I like it. Options, in other words. Uh -huh. When you started to wear that mask, then you started to say that you don't really hate masks as much as you did before. So, to wear a mask, ah, it has become a, a common knowledge or a manner, let's say. And everybody has this rule or accepted this uh, new common sense to wear a mask where you go to a public place. So, there's actually one news that I would like to share. This is uh, from the Ramaphosa, pre uh, President Ramaphosa from uh, South Africa. When he was making a speech, when the Omicron variant, uh, variant was uh, discovered, the emergence of the Omicron variant should be a wake-up call to the world that the vaccine inequality cannot be allowed to continue. So, until everyone is vaccinated, everyone will be at risk. Until everyone is vaccinated, we should expect that more variants will emerge. So, the masks are widely acknowledged and used. But on the other hand, the vaccination or the vaccines themselves have some uh, inequality. The vaccines were developed at a miraculous pace, but there's also um, this unequalness in its distribution. So Yoichi was talking about diversity, of course, Audrey, you too. New ways of approaching the situation has been uh, helping us to strive in this situation. But at the same time, how can we tackle and how can we ideate on this unequalness or maybe I'm talking a bit too romantic or dreamy, but uh, how do we, how, how will we be able to tackle this unbalance? Maybe you can start from Yoichi. Maybe the question was a bit too difficult, but or did, maybe you can start from Audrey in that sense. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I was able to uh, travel because I was vaccinated fully with uh, two doses of AstraZeneca um, was because of partnership, right? The uh, uh, people from Japan uh, donated AstraZeneca vaccines uh, to Taiwan, uh, which formed the kind of backbone of our uh, mass vaccination platform. Without the Japanese donations, the platform that you showed that I helped build and design uh, could not operate because we would didn't have anything uh, to vaccinate uh, people with. Uh, so again, uh, my gratitude uh, and sincere um, appreciation of this partnership. And I think a lot of this boils down to making sure that the supply is plenty, especially in places uh, without the storage uh, requirements that can host the um, kind of vaccines that requires uh, more storage um, restrictions like the mRNA vaccines. We need to work on, for example, the subunits technologies and so on. Uh, in, in Taiwan, of course, Medigen uh, is currently undergoing 
the partnership with uh, the Coalition for Academic Preparedness Innovations, the CEPI, as well as the WHO um, as a kind of phase three study on both mix and match and as well as the vaccine itself. And once proven safe, then it would be uh, much more easy to distribute to the places with minimum uh, storage requirements. So at the end, I think that could be solved with supply side technology and we're working on that. Understood. So, although it's on, it's not in balance, in good balance at the moment, or not distributed widely at the moment, it will come as technology or science advance. Is that uh, your message? And my message is that we need to fund uh, internationally the kind of vaccine technologies that are more equal when it comes to distribution requirements. Understood. So, Yoichi, uh, especially around vaccinations or vaccines, there is a, a disparity between countries. For example, in Japan, we were able to share with Taiwan, but there's a lot of issues around Africa, the global south, and you've been mentioning about this a lot. Uh, I think this is a uh, unsolved issue. Uh, what do you think about international balance? It hasn't been solved at all in the past few years. I think it's one of the most hard issues that we need to tackle. And the one of the main issues regarding vaccination is about fundings. And maybe some part of it can be about the diplomatic issues, for example, which country is coming from where or where, and th there are some conflicts between that part. But most of all, it is about the economics or the funding. So there is a certain new vaccination being, being created, then it's monopolized, and then it also creates new fund. But I think it, the most important thing is to make it open source. And how to make this open source um, with a very, uh, with a uh, very, uh, with a safe uh, verification method is important. I think we can make an open source platform. I think we can make a new OS. I think we can make a, you know, for example, a new Web3 or blockchain or, or a DOS. So we can have new ideas. How can we apply these kind of new methods to vaccinations or medicine? This is a very difficult issue. We are making medicine in a very centralized system, very closely related to the nation state. What are we doing with vaccination, uh, with vaccines? Um, it's actually about information, about um, protein and acid. So how can we use, uh, how can we utilize these information so that everyone can make this by themselves. I think that's one of the core problems that we are facing. Mm, I see. So how can we make a place, how can we make a century or a partnership to create vaccinations everywhere in a free way? You know, the important thing is, vaccination is about open sources. For example, papers regarding vaccinations are open. It's open, it's open access. But most of the papers are becoming open access. The target, uh, we know about the, the DNA of the target that we want to deliver, but the production phase is a problem. How can we make this part open of the information of the target? How can we create uh, this? Uh, industry in our own way, in our own countries is important. For example, if it's Pfizer, they should have been creating that vaccination with a with a huge investment, so they will not be able to uh, give it away. Well, you know, I, if there is an open source that combats this, I think this should be accepted by society. If something is made open source, and if, um, you know, um, uh, new ways of rights or so, so forth come along, I think the international society should combat this. Interesting.
Interesting. Audrey, what do you think? Um, I, I'm not too familiar with uh, computers and when it comes down to open source programs, um, but you know, I think there is always a, a potential for local knowledge and such to be also be shared by open sources as well. How can we connect this wisdom and the open source? Um, what do you think about this? Yeah, we're, we're already seeing that uh, the open source, open hardware movement around the home testing kits, right, the rapid testing kits, uh, which initially started as kind of um, lower quality in terms of precision, uh, but has grown a lot uh, in the past couple of years. And now, of course, the rapid testing enable the kind of contact tracing work uh, that can uh, basically uh, combat the virus variants with a higher R value with more or less uh, the same uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions because of the, as I mentioned, the shortened time it takes from a case being detected as well as the contact tracing uh, to work. And in that sense, I believe the both the SMS-based contact tracing as well as the rapid testing kits uh, are already seeing the power of open source. Indeed, uh, the Japanese company Line uh, actually changed uh, their main QR code scanner of adding each other as friends uh, to support the 1922 SMS testing method because it's an open standard based on SMS sending and so on. So they were able to independently develop it along with, of course, HTC and Trend Micro and so on uh, on the common standard. Uh, had we patented uh, the 1922 SMS uh, QR code strategy, that would not be possible for people to adapt so quickly. Mm, it's too late. You talked about how people are going to change to heaven and to, uh, slaves, and one solution might be open source. So, it's one or the other. You tend to think like GAFA, and then a new open source like Japan, Taiwan, non US companies might be able to go after this. Is there that possibility, do you think? Well, to start out with, open source or patents, why did they appear when you think about that? That is, all over the world, all over the world, if I want to use a different Facebook, then Facebook doesn't have that. If I want to create a different iPhone, an iPhone is an iPhone, Coca-Cola is Coca-Cola, Toyota is Toyota. So one brand or one structure, everyone with law, capital, using things like that to tie it down. This has now become more complete. So now, a lot of indigenous peoples are using smartphones on the earth. It's like a chain of rights and places that are unpolluted are difficult to find. But substantially, before we came up with these rules, it was open source, and substantially we were distributed. But when you think about that, digital nature, so what we need to think about is, as part of this, so paradise in a capitalism, it's a paradise that has sucked up a lot of profit from capitalism. And just paying the cost means that uh, most of what you make as a living is um, used up to pay this. So once you know that that's happening, then these people should try to create their own, their own system that they need. And when they create the system that they need, open source is going to be key. And this kind of thing, there'll be clashes or they'll be fused together. And gradually, gradually, a basic income type society and a venture capital type society. In other words, the type of society that sucks up capital and the ones that reallocate horizontally and live together with nature. I think it's going to be separated into these two. Personally, that's what I think. Yes, that's true. And open source is important because we don't have a commons yet. I see. So things like vaccines, if we could develop them in that way, that would be good. Well, it's not impossible. However, there's no guarantee. That's the problem right now. Guarantee, you say? So because the 
government guarantees we can vaccinate, but you cannot define under the current law what that is, because with pharmaceuticals are decided by government's law. So if you break out from the government, if you have medication, could you use that medication that is not approved by the government? I mean, it is possible to use it, but that's quite difficult in some countries and the issue of law and pharmaceuticals is a difficult issue so what you create over open source how do you uh, share that that's difficult and audrey including what yoichi just said let me show you the next slide and then i have a question to ask you so Audrey, regarding partnership for the girls, so that's the 17th SDG, and this is out of the 17 SDGs, this is the most important, I remember you saying that. So why do you think so? That's my first question. And this goal, especially under COVID-19, what meaning does this goal have? Audrey-san, I'd be interested in your views. Certainly. So um, I uh, always uh, sign off with live long and prosper. Uh, but these two values without partnership for the goals uh, are usually in opposition to one, one another, right? Uh, to live long, that's to say to sustain, means that we prioritize uh, future generations. But to prosper, that is to say to develop, means that we prioritize our current generation. And so th this entire idea of sustainable development in one sentence, uh, and then uh, trying to paint it as a coherent goal, relies on somehow this generation makes peace with the interest of the next generation between the short term and the long term, between the environment's concerns and the societal concerns so that the economy can be regenerative in instead of exploitative on one generation or the other. So without uh, open innovation, without reliable data, there is simply no way for this kind of understanding to form so that we know when working on one of the 17 goals is not canceling out the effect of someone else working on the other of the 17 goals. I see. So based on this, I believe that among partnership for the goals, we talked about mutual sharing of innovation. And regarding this, you were saying you think this is very important. So overcoming national borders, do you think this is possible? Mutual sharing of innovation, is that possible? Or like the vaccines, is this going to become distorted? Well, are we not doing it right now? So it's not just possible, we're doing it right now. You are doing it, excuse me, I see. For example, mutual sharing of innovation. Can you give me specific examples of what's being done mm -hmm. now? Yeah, uh, like literally recording this show together. So uh, as we are recording this together, our conversation, uh, of course, I have uh, our own camera crew uh, taking the picture. And we also have uh, all of your voice, including an interpreter's voice, uh, that we're going to ask you whether it's okay to contribute to the Creative Commons. And if you said no, of course, we will uh, remute you. But if you said yes, then of course, we will publish this into the Creative Commons where anyone, including um, hip hop bands like Dos Monos, uh, can remix uh, into their own liking. And so uh, when Yoichi talks about digital commons, uh, this is by definition, the digital commons and we're contributing to the commons as we speak like literally as we speak uh, across the jurisdictional borders i see right i agree so yoichi the other day you were saying even if you speak on the media it just gets consumed and in the end it doesn't come into reality so maybe you will not speak about it but in a true sense of the word, we have to have a commons. What you say has to become commons, because there are people who listen who do not execute. So regarding this, could you please tell us why you said that? Well, when it becomes a buzzword, most things disappear. In other words, a buzzword and what we really have to do, the direction is slightly off. There's a mismatch. 
And the value itself, for example, the moonshot, the moon itself does have meaning, but the word moonshot probably has no meaning at all. So going to the moon is important, but the word moonshot becomes a buzzword, which means that in the end, no one goes to the moon. So at a time like that, the popular words right now, or words that people say, and then things just settle down and nothing is done. So what do we do about that? I'm very interested. So that buzzword, people talk about it and then they're satisfied and then they don't take action. There's a lot of things like that. So regarding the moon, you should talk a lot about the moon, but talking about moonshot a lot has no meaning. I see, that's true. And Audrey, regarding this theme, so just talking about it and people don't take action, there are a lot of things like that. With COVID-19, there have been a lot of good buzzwords, but we don't really see action following. So what should we do? What can we do? Audrey, could you let us know what you think? Yeah, I, I do believe that it's possible to communicate uh, uh, in a as-is way, right? Describing things as it is. If it's in the commons, well, we call it commons. We don't call it, say, metaverse. Uh, so, and then uh, using the words that represents um, the everyday meaning of what we're going through allows everyone to understand how to take part. Uh, as I mentioned, the way we designed the 1922 SMS was that that anyone can just generate their own 15-digit random code. You don't have to apply it from a central assigned authority or anything. Just roll some dice, generate a 15-digit random code, and then you can participate and print that QR code. Uh, and indeed, uh, more than 2 million venues did so uh, once we introduced the system. So in a decentralized way, with the ideas very firmly understood in very easy to explain fashion without any buzzwords, that promotes action from everyone who are concerned uh, that the contact tracing is taking too long and then before long it become the norm even when we didn't cite that it's mandatory many venues offered it of course they still offer pen and paper for people who uh, don't want to scan a qr code so it doesn't take any freedom away it adds freedom precisely because we chose intentionally very easy to understand parts described with very easy to understand words Understood. I think I, I think I understood. So, not to say that we have to do a QR code, but actually just sit doing one by one, and that will like create a custom or activity in the end. That is the moon. Uh, say it after you do. Maybe that's another way of saying in my words. Thank you very much. So I will hope that this program does not become a buzzword and be consumed. I will do my best. Uh, really? So, finally, we would like to go to our next theme. So I would like to share my screen again. Thank you for sharing your ideas on the second topic. Now let's go to the third. So, in 2022, what kind of new world can we think? How can we describe? In the recent data, is there any, we asked people if there's anything that they want to do or spend on 2022. First, the, in first place was traveling. For example, Kyoto is uh, filled with tourists at the moment, and we heard that also in Taiwan, after uh, the uh, the peak was over, there were a lot of uh, people reserving hotels. The urge to move around. We looked into a paper from a 2020 in Nature. What kind of positive effects does mobilize, uh, mo mobility bring to the human brain? We looked into a few uh, 132 people and how they moved around. The people who are moving around more have a better effect on the hippo a hippocampal, hippocampal part of the brain. So uh, it actually proves scientifically on how people like to move around. 
This was what the paper was proving. Although people are still having restrictions in their mobility, once we are suppressed so much, uh, people began, begin to think and have that urge of wanting to move. The feeling becomes stronger. How can we liberate our feeling? How can we uh, get, let go and let out of our needs uh, is the next topic that we'd like to discuss. Uh, maybe I'm uh, overcomplicating this too much, uh, but uh, Audrey, do you have any ideas on these topics? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, uh, I think it's quite intuitive uh, with people that we want to travel together. Uh, we say travel makes friends, of course, also breaks friends. Uh, but in any case, new experiences uh, tend to stimulate our social connections better. So I do think that uh, in two different aspects, one is that interactive, immersive video gaming, for example, is also a change of scenery. And we've also seen that it has skyrocketed over the past couple of years so that people want to spend more time in, I don't know, Minecrafts or Gather Towns uh, for the simple configuration, but more and more complicated configuration uh, that uh, designs a truly immersive experience, co-presence, shared presence as well. So that's the first part. And for the second part, we are also seeing that people uh, take to domestic traveling because um, Japan and Taiwan are both relatively safe. So we t uh, take much more time to spend on the places that are not very far, uh, certainly not a different time zone, but a different culture. So we start to discover the coaches that are nearby but were previously ignored uh, by our current community or neighborhood and that brought much more conversations among the 20 national languages in Taiwan including the sign language which is also a national language here. Ah, so did you say sign language? Is that also another mm -hmm. thing that is everybody is looking, uh, paying attention these days? Yes, because uh, during the uh, every 2 p.m. press conference by the Central Epidemic Command Center, uh, there's always sign language interpreting going on, especially, as I mentioned, by law. It's part of the 20 national languages that we should provide uh, real-time interaction in. Uh, and so uh, both because that people see it much more because of the national act, but also because people are, are now much more paying attention to the domestic traveling and domestic coaches in Taiwan. So there's a, a real uh, resurgence uh, in the educational materials, online interactive courses, and things like that, that uh, immerses people into the uh, coaches of all the sign languages, as well as, of course, the other national languages, the indigenous, the Hakka, the Holok, and so on. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So a new way of perceiving the world may be through sign language as well. That's also a new mm -hmm. way of traveling. Mm -hmm. So Yoichi, what do you think about uh, this urge of people wanting to move around and this uh, feeling of wanting to be liberated? Mm, if you say to be freed from suppression, I guess people, uh, human beings are animals and our DNA hasn't changed so much. Um, so before the uh, farm or agricultural age, we have been moving around almost um, miles per year and I don't think the few thousand years will allow us to settle down somewhere compared to the uh, to the length of how much we've been moving around in the past we have always been moving around and that's a fact if we look back 4,000 years ago that's not too long ago and if you think about this, maybe not moving around airplanes, that, that's a different thing. Airplanes are very recent. But if we think about moving around with our physical state or physical body, I think that's something very important. When I move around Tokyo, I move in a bicycle. And if we... There's this uh, concept called mecha biology, um, and we have all these different stimulations from heat, and all those different stimulations will stabilize or bring homeostatic state to our mental state. 
So this is something that we can call as a physical knowledge or physical intelligence. And I think 2021, uh, we wanted to or have been claiming that sense of intelligence, the physical intelligence. So you don't necessarily have to travel, but we have to move around more. And that's something that we know. And how to retrieve that, how to regain that. Uh, everybody has a different approach in my sense bicycles. Maybe some people are running with uh, room runners or some people might be doing marathon within the scene or might be play, uh, dancing. I think that's free. So in that physical knowledge or physical intelligence, like you mentioned, do you think uh, video games are physical knowledge? Well, it could be, but I have to. I think that it always has to include some kind of movement. For example, uh, using the reflection, or not only the brain, but moving around with muscles and bones, and that person has to create their own way of moving around, even though it is about the interaction with the video game. Mm -hmm. It may be a stationary bicycle. Stationary bicycle, that's right. <laughs> stationary bicycle, so... <laughs> There's one word, buzzword, um, uh, metaverse, and there's a lot of people who are boasting into, in, uh, to some extent that metaverse is the uh, word of 2021. <laughs> And it's also uh, one of the trend words in the business scene as well. Do you think that metaverse will be something that will uh, fulfill the need of movements? I think we need to really think about what really is about um, what, what really is being fulfilled, what is the real need. I want to meet people, I want to see new things. How can we achieve this? But it's not really about traveling, but how can we also fulfill um, uh, you know, our responsibility to the nature? If we, the resolution of the metaverse uh, increases, that's much better. <laughs> but uh, the technological advancement is not there. Our brain, things are more vivid. Materiality, Google, uh, Google, materiality glasses didn't, does not allow this. So Audrey, what's your view on these things that people call metaverse? Well, maybe because I read Snow Crash very early on. So to me, the term metaverse belongs to the same era as when I encountered the word cyberspace. Uh, to me, they're kind of synonyms, and I uh, was exposed to them at around the same year. Uh, so to me, it conveys a sense of nostalgia, uh, not anything that's in the future. Uh, so uh, I think, yeah, it's just uh, people's, um, as uh, Yuichi have said, um, real needs that could be fulfilled uh, by ever increasing bandwidth and ever reducing latency and more and more and more we're approaching uh, the cyberspace or metaverse uh, but to me it's not something uh, shiny exciting new uh, because to me it's my childhood like literally <laughs> I see, we think it's state of the art, but it's been talked about for a long time, metaverse. Yes, people have forgotten about a second life, have they? Yes, second life, that's true, that used to exist. We used to talk about that. Right, I understand. So, it's true, at the beginning, so going to meet people, traveling with people, going to see your friend, that's one of the benefits of traveling, we were talking about that. In that respect, we have the final video, the third video, about a traveler. And then we'd like to go into the final part of our talk session. So, this is the final video. Could you please play the video? There is no sound. Why are they turning that?
Okay, that was the video. And Yoichi, in the briefing, he said Einstein attracted his attention. And I looked into this. This was interesting. So after World War One, he traveled in Japan. And after World War Two, after his reflection, this led to global peace movements. And it was experience traveling that led to change the future. So regarding Einstein's travels, what do you think? Yes, there was more of a story to this than expected. So when Einstein came to Japan, he was welcomed. I remember reading an article about that. And Einstein is European, so in Europe, he spent time there. And then in Japan, Japan is very pastoral. And it, Japan probably seemed very interesting to him. And in the war, after the atomic bombing and before and after, he probably thought a lot about that, I think. So this kind of thing. And on the internet, if you're involved in IT and the internet, we, in any country, so we think about um, C plus or any language that's not a natural language, we write our programs using common languages. We don't really think about this. And in the world of IT, the physical things do not move in most cases. And we don't really fight or shoot bullets or launch missiles. We don't really think about that. But, of course, to control missiles, IT technologies are used. And to kill people using drones, software, machine learning is used. So this kind of thing, how do we think about that? For us, we should be more sensitive about this. But things that are based on IT, close to idea, ideal, close to the ideal. So the cruelty of human beings, you tend to forget about that, not feel it. And I think in the 2020s, we should not avert our eyes from that. So and Einstein probably, so probably we talked about the theory of relativity and there was a lot of molecular uh, physics that blossomed. And I think that was a very happy time of his life. But from there, in the United States, there was the nuclear bomb plan. And watching that, he probably noticed that there were a lot of problems. He probably realized that and sensed that. Yes, that's very interesting. So, so if this interpreter had not been traveling with him, he would not have thought about who they were bombing with the A-bomb. So because he had traveled in Japan, he thought, ah, Hiroshima Nagasaki, that's where I traveled with the interpreter. So knowing about that country is important. You cannot imagine what you have not experienced. And Einstein, he traveled in Japan. That's why the atomic bomb that he developed brought suffering to Japan. And he felt very guilty about this. And with his friends at the time, he tried to start the peace movement. So knowing your counterpart means that you know the world beyond. And in that respect, overcoming national borders and being connected is important. That's one of the lessons. So Audrey, Audrey, what did you think about the video? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think uh, I said uh, many times that well, IT is about connecting machines. Digital is about connecting people. And the reason why we want to connect people uh, is not just for connectiveness sake, but rather that we want to understand each other so we arrive at common values and also to innovate and let our innovations tackle the challenges that arise from pursuing of those common values together over many generations. And so it means bringing together the values of people existing in different localities, different time zones, but also opening up to the possibility of future generations. And both are key to the peace movement because without this understanding, we will be in a dark forest, as some science fiction have suggested, uh, where war is uh, an inevitable um, result and so just by changing the dimension of connectivity, can we avoid war and search peace instead? So in that respect, last year, Audrey was saying something interesting. He was saying the world with COVID-19, the world has a common problem. That's why mutual understanding has moved forward like, like no other era. 
That's what you were saying. And do you think things are improving further or going forward? Uh, do you think there's lots more homework that we have to think about? What do you think? I think um, we are now progressing to a point uh, where international workforces on specific counter-pandemic measures can be assembled on top of open access and shared learning platforms and so on that are the backbone of further research, for example, on mitigating the climate crisis and things like that, because we already understand that the collective response to a common urgency is a constructive one. So we can, just like you hearing the ambulance from here, which is miles away actually from where you are physically at, but you feel the urgency uh, that this ambulance means to me, and then we can strategize on something. Of course, I'm using that as a metaphor. But uh, the point here is that uh, previously, we kind of assume that urgency are tackled in a domestic uh, priority and that it's okay to externalize some of the bad consequences of our solutions to the next generation or to the people we have never met. But during COVID, uh, that's not the norm anymore. Just like showing off uh, is not the norm anymore during COVID-19 on social media. We're now um, turned to a new direction of, as I said, the global neighborhood around common urgencies. Of course, there's a lot of work still to be done uh, understanding the climate situation as we now understand the coronavirus strains and so on. But I think we're pivoted uh, to the right direction. Thank you very much. So, finally, I have a request to Yoichi. In that sense, to live together or being together, Yoichi has been uh, stating this idea of homo convivium. Why do you think this is important? Can you explain to us and Audrey? Sure, sure. So homo something something or homo blah blah blah. There's a lot of these. Homo sapiens, homo ludens, homo fable, fable. So homo ludens is about people, uh, is about the humans are about playing playing play instruments, theater, games, and have been creating culture. Homo fable is about making, making tools, making new things. Homo sapiens, I think this is a really nice word, because maybe science or culture or engineering or design or art, we have been accumulating or building up these different cultures and that's how that's what it describes so sapiens is very important but at the same time i think it's important to view humanity at, in the terms of how can we live together how do we exist together we have been connecting to this very highly developed network and only have passed 20 or 30 years and that's a new experience for humanity in general so, for example, ants or dolphins or other species have been connected to network for millions of years, for example. So I think, um, I think um, dolphins has been connected for uh, six, 40, 46 million years, for example. So, Anyway, uh, convivium means it comes from a Latin word of being together, and in French it means to live together. In English, conviviality um, it means uh, to party. In Spanish, conviviencia it means to coexist. In the history of Spain, if we go back 500 years, the conviviencia, if different people from different religions live together for 500 years, it is a state of convivial. Convivium, how to live together, how to be a connected humanity, what can we think and how do, should we think? What is our characteristics and how are we evolving? And I think this is one thing that will continue to uh, remain as a characteristics of humanity. So when we think about conviviality and when we feel about it, how can we feel about it? We are 
layering the sense of sapience, but also there's a layer uh, or there's a spectrum that we need to think about when we think about um, a convivium. There's a different angle there. When we rethink about this, I think the body or the physical is looking for a convivium, sharing spaces, having intelligence through our bodies. And then when you talk about sapiens, reading, about, uh, reading a paper from somebody who is in another place or from another time, but you can also imagine it in a very vivid way. That's what sapiens does. But to overcome our great divide, I think we need to think about this convivium aspect of human humanity. So sapiens will implement IT and we are trying to pursue our way as a homo convivium. So what's your idea, uh, you know, after hearing this explanation, Audrey? I think it's great. Uh, just as I put a one in the sapiens, uh, there's still a I in convivial uh, that I can put the one in uh, to digitalize uh, the part of the word. Uh, and, and that's important because, as I said, uh, part of me now are being augmented by the assistive technology, not just the eyeglass, but also this one side earphone, which is the shape of one, I guess, <laughs> which uh, connects me, right? The, the sapiens part of me and the convivial part part of me uh, to, to Yoichi and the interpreter and the moderator and really uh, another world uh, altogether miles away. Uh, but that's that's conviviality because we're sharing each other's presence, although in a fragmented fashion. Uh, but that's still important because it brings up new inspiration and new possibilities uh, that let us think beyond our immediate corners uh, of the world. So I fully understand and support uh, this idea of homo sapiens not being analyzed as individuals, but rather as convivial um, animals. Being together and the value of being convivial, maybe I'm asking something very stupid, but what do you think makes a convivial state, Ochi, uh, Yoichi-san? Something that I've been doing recently, I have been printing uh, photography to Japanese traditional paper. And paper, it's made handmade. And, you know, usual paper, we use it definitely. Or we, but when it comes to a handmade paper, one paper is used in, uh, is made by hours and hours of handcraft. So we can't really throw it away. So the letters that we write down um, suddenly has a strong meaning and it generates a resonance in our physical state. The, the, the letters hold meaning. So the feeling of somebody doing something for you um, is that sense is easily lost in our society. In a, in a per, as a person from IT, if somebody writes a comment on what you're doing, we feel like, oh, thank you. But uh, you know, in, in a GitHub situation, maybe, and when somebody shares what I'm doing, I feel like, oh, thank you so much. But when we're here, we always forget, or we tend to forget, um, somebody has done something for me for a mutual understanding and to share that sense of existence. I think that is the uh, importance of conviviality. That was very easy to understand. To see the face of another person or how to, how to create tools to see the opponent, I think that's something important. Indeed, indeed. When, you know, I think, Audrey, you, you yourself, you are a programmer, but for a person who can't write any programs, we have a feeling that we can't see the face. We have no idea how to write and we have no idea who is writing. Um, but, you know, I think each programming um, or uh, masterpiece that is brought out from that has somebody who has produced it and there is a intention and a meaning behind that. Um, so uh, you, uh, we're kind of going into... So what do you think um, as, you know, a, a programmer? Well, program is, is just a use of words, 
right? In a way that, of course, has a tangible effect, but most of which are meant for other people to read. So in, in any sense, it's exactly the same as writing, just with a different kind of rhyming, a different kind of format. Uh, but at the end of the day, a programmer's ability is constrained only uh, by the mastery of words, exactly like a writer. So it's just like writing uh, the Faust, I guess, that you have to tell a very long story, but you also have to rhyme. Uh, and that's the kind of uh, writing that uh, programming uh, means to me. And also means to give new associations, new links to existing vocabulary. Because like most writers, uh, programmers do not start from scratch, uh, even if they're programming in the language. Scratch, uh, they mostly begin with the blocks that are already constructed by the programmers before. And again, this is the same for novelists and anyone working in a literary field. Uh, the citations are much more powerful than having to construct any Anything uh, from scratch, and which is why I think to me it's really the same activity. And um, when, when I mentioned uh, that in the convivial uh, there's more bandwidth, uh, I don't think I actually conveyed my uh, idea through, so I just drew it out. Yeah, it. There's actually now you know two double the bandwidth uh, of the binary <laughs> in the homo and the convivial in an intersubjective way. So uh, and and what I mean by this more than a wordplay is that when we write programs as a program and myself, we always have the next maintainer, the next programmer that's going to reuse my program in mind. And in a sense, it's communication between two human beings as well. Indeed. So, um, Yoichi, you actually cite a lot about the cloth um, to add or patchworks to connect different things and making something. I think when it was a time where people didn't have any uh, enough substances or like enough material, um, people in, for example, China and Japan. Um, the materials to make clothes were very, very rare. So that's why we created, began to create patchworks, and that was very important. When people do not have enough resource, people start to create something new rather than consuming. That's one aspect from the uh, resource perspective. When we talk about IT, um, when we have resource, it starts to rot, it starts to go to waste. But IT, but when it comes to IT, if something is left from back from, let's say, 100 years ago, we can reuse it. We can continue to uh, think about it. There's a freedom. So we can actually think or try to solve something that hasn't been solved for 100 years. And then there's something that um, we can realize um, that uh, so, so through people, we can have that length of enjoy, finding joy and finding problems um, beyond time and space. So I think we can uh, actually continue to weave the different issues and uh, riddles that humanity has been uh, finding out. So I think we can uh, continue to dig in deeper into these topics as well. No, I think we've heard lots of good things today. And when you meet next time, what would you like to talk about? That's what I'd like to ask you. Well, what I'm interested in now is the other time, I was in the mountains in Gifu Prefecture, that's in the center of Japan, a lot of forests, deep forests, and it's a mountainous area, and only around the rivers there's flat land, that's the only place where there's flat land. And back in the Jomon era, around 12,000 years ago, that's where people were living. And in an area maybe 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers aside, in a historic um, site, you see a pottery or earthenware from around 10,000 years ago. And these people, um, they were hunters and gatherers, and they wandered around in that really small area. And maybe 10, 12,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, they were wandering around this tiny area. And that's really actually very difficult. A variety of civilizations, they do not last that long. 
And uh, after agriculture, cities will change, but with the hunter-gatherers, the people's lives, and uh, here, there was a good balance. And for more than 10,000 years, they were able to wander around and continue to exist. However, the land was acid, which means that their bones melted away, so we cannot tell what they were like back then. But their pottery, their earthenware, so if you use them 30 times before, they were unusable. So people throw them away and then rebuild them. And there are lots of these being unearthed now. But this kind of uh, not much burden on the environment. And the number of people converging. So this kind of way of living exists across the world. And there are lots of hints that they can give us. Back then, they had no writing. And there's nothing that was saved, so we cannot tell. However, so with current archaeology, looking back over the past, and when we think about our current sustainable ecosystem, as we continue fieldwork, I'm sure there are lots of things that we can realize this year. And, uh, I hope that we can um, come to you and with the answers. So, Audrey, so we talked about civilization. Will we be able to talk about civilization the next time the two of you meet? Uh, as I mentioned, I will be bringing my undivided attention. My interest always is to listen. And then uh, I trust my future self will think of something to say. I understand. So, Audrey-san, I think you're running out of time, so we have to say goodbye. But thank you very much for today, and let's meet again next year. Okay. Uh, well, we, we did go through all the units that we want to talk about, right? Did we? Thank you very much. Uh, okay. All right. Excellent. So, looking forward to speak uh, sometime in the next year. Live long and prosper. I hope you have a good year. <laughs> you too. Hi. See you. See you. Bye. Thank you very much. See you again. So, Audrey Stan, thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you. And thank you especially for the moderating and interpreting work. Uh, it's very, very smooth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. お疲れ様でした。お疲れ様でございました。はい。えっとどうちゃんさん、一回休憩していただいて、そこでちょっと軽く感想を3分ほど聞いて終わりにします。はい。え、深いところまで行きましたね。はい。<笑><笑> Okay,我现在要这样。结束了吗?对的,结束了,他们已经挂了。结束了。结束了。结束了。结束了。结束了。结束了。结束了。结束了。结束了。结束了。结束了。结束了。结束了。结束了。结束了。结束了。结束了。